Good evening. This, uh, welcome to the uh, Thursday, March 11th meeting of the uh, uh, Police Oversight Agency Board. Um, I'd like to um, call this meeting to order and uh, go through the uh, list of uh, people who are in attendance by Zoom. This meeting will be conducted by Zoom and uh, it's available, be available for either uh, uh, viewing on uh, GovTV or streaming on YouTube. And the uh, videos will be made available um, uh, at, uh, through the uh, GovTV website as well as the CPOA website. So uh, in attendance tonight, we have a, a full quorum of the board. Members uh, are Mia Pruitt, Member Galloway, Member Nixon, Member Olivas, and Member Mitchell uh, from APD. As, well, I'm sorry, let me back up. We have the, from the C Civilian Police Oversight Agency, we have Director Edward Harness, um, uh, Katrina Sagala. Um, I'm looking for Valerie. Is Valerie here? I don't see. Um, from the uh, from APD, we have um, Commander Zach Cottrell, uh, the um, uh, I don't see them present at the moment, but we will be having uh, Chief Medina and uh, uh, Superintendent Stanley uh, here uh, to uh, give us a briefing. Uh, let's see, who else is here from APD? Oh, Commander Corey Lowe. And uh, let's see, from the legal department or from the city of Albuquerque, we have uh, Esteban Aguilar, uh, Melissa Kuntz, and uh, let's see, I, who have I missed? Oh, Lindsey Van Meter. From the city, we have Pastor David Walker. We have uh, Chris Silvan, Elizabeth Martinez from the DOJ. And I'm looking to see if I missed anybody. I, if, you, if I missed you, let me know. I will uh, be happy to include you back in at some other time. But Chris Silvan, did I mention you? I think I did not. So welcome everyone. Um, the mission statement for the uh, Civilian Police Oversight Agency is advancing constitutional policing and accountability for APD and the Albuquerque community. Uh, so we're at item three, which is approval of the agenda. Uh, before we uh, we have a motion to approve the agenda, we'll have some have some changes once we get a motion to approve. So motion to approve the agenda. Second. Second. And uh, so. Um, <laughs> Before we approve the agenda, I'd like to amend it to include the, uh, uh, we have as guest tonight, uh, report from uh, the uh, new chief of APD, uh, Harold Medina, and the new superintendent for uh, reform, I believe, uh, Sylvester Stanley. So uh, we'll be adding those to uh, item six when we get the reports from APD, which is coming up very shortly. So if we can have a, a motion to approve the agenda as amended, I, uh, or the amendment to the agenda, then uh, we- I Motion would... to amend the agenda as stated. Second. Second, all right. Uh, in favor of amending the agenda, uh, member Amia Pruitt? Yes. Member Galloway? Yes. Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Levis, the chair votes yes. To, um, I see. So, do we need a further uh, motion to approve this uh, agenda, or is this does this do it? I think we're we're good. Okay. So, um, the uh, agenda has been approved as amended, and we're at item four, which is public comments. We received uh, the board received four public comments from Geraldine Amato, and those have been circulated for the board's reading. Um, item, we're at item five, review and approval of the minutes from the March 4th study session. Uh, so I could have, uh, those minutes have been attached to the ad agenda earlier. So if I could have a motion to approve those minutes. So moved. Uh, second. 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 All right, in favor of approving the minutes from March 4th special uh, study session. Member Mio Pruitt. Yes. Member Galloway. Did, did I hear a yes? Member Mitchell. Yes. Member Nixon. Yes. Member Olivas. Yes. Chair votes yes. So the uh, 
the minutes from the March 4th study session meeting are approved as, uh, as submitted. So we're at item six, reports from city department. And as I mentioned, we have uh, from uh, APD, newly uh, appointed uh, Ch Chief Harold Medina, and I would, we'd, we'd turn over the remarks uh, to him. So Chief Medina. Actually, Chief Dr. Dr. Kess, if I may, I would actually like to uh, introduce both Chief Medina and the superintendent, as well as to give the board a brief background about the announcement on Monday, if that's okay. Yes, yes, you, yes, sir, go ahead. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Dr. Kess and members of the board. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all tonight. Uh, again, my name is Steve Aguilar. I'm an Albuquerque City Attorney. On Monday, Mayor Keller made uh, two significant appointments to uh, the Albuquerque Police Department. Uh, the first was Harold Medina, who is the new Chief of Police of the Albuquerque Police Department. Uh, the second is Sylvester Stanley, who is the superintendent of police reform and the deputy chief administrative officer. So uh, the reason there were, there was multiple uh, reasons that went into this decision uh, to have two individuals. One, we had a very robust or the administration had a very robust input process. And what was clear was that there seemed to be an equal divide of individuals who were wanting a chief of police from the community and individuals who wanted one from outside. Um, given the volume of work, understandably, it was it was a it was difficult to uh, to have one person. As Mayor Keller said, we were looking for a unicorn. But what instead what what the administration has done is they they have uh, pioneered a new uh, model uh, that is taking some guidance from some of the other compliance areas uh, in some other cities. Uh, but this is essentially a brand new model. And so I'll break down just briefly for you the, uh, the organizational structure and the thinking. So Chief Medina will re remain uh, the chief of police and will handle everything operation related. He will also oversee the Special Operations Bureau, uh, the Professional Standards and Accountability Bureau, the Field Services Bureau, investigations and management as a uh, I'm sorry, Management Services and Support Bureau as well. Superintendent Stanley will be coming in and taking over uh, two of the problematic areas that have been identified in uh, the most recent Monta report and has led to uh, a lot of the work and the collaboration between the city, between APD and uh, our partners in the Department of Justice. So uh, Superintendent Stanley will be overseeing the Academy uh, as well as Internal Affairs Divisions, both professional standards and force, as well as the community engagement positions. So um, uh, Commissioner Stanley has a long history of, of service, just like Chief Medina in our community. And this is a great option and a great fit because he will be joining the city, not having served under APD, but having most recently served as the chief of the Isleta Police. He is broad experience both in community policing concepts, but also with training and internal affairs matters. So uh, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce both of them tonight and to uh, ask them to speak and, and to uh, address the board if they wish. And then the board uh, certainly is welcome to answer any questions. And we appreciate the opportunity and certainly appreciate you uh, moving the agenda around to make this accommodation. So thank you all so much. Steve, this is uh, Chief Medina, Dr. Cass, uh, board members. Thank you for allowing me uh, some time to speak this evening. I just want to first uh, say I'm humbled by uh, Mayor Keller's confidence in appointing me as chief of police and also thankful for those city councilors who uh, have already shown support. Uh, I think that uh, it's important that we continue to move forward as a police department. And the reason I really support this structure is uh, during the past six months, I've seen how difficult and how time consuming this job is and the challenges that we have uh, within the department. Uh, we're trying to fight crime on one side and we're trying to come in compliance on the other. And quite simply, at times, there's not enough hours in the day. Uh, I think that also uh, it's good uh, to ensure that uh, we have an outside set of eyes, uh, different opinions coming in and assisting us and my role is going to continue to be focusing on, on our four key areas that we've always said, uh, number one being crime reduction, uh, reducing crime, uh, number two being 
uh, doing it in a constitutional manner and ensuring that we're following the guidelines of the settlement agreement. Uh, number three, uh, recruiting. I'm happy to say that next week we'll be uh, retiring. I mean, uh, we'll be uh, graduating uh, 46 new cadets. We're also starting a couple of new traditions uh, with this academy class. And uh, one of them is the pinning of the badge in which we're gonna ask a family member uh, to do that. And uh, we have a new oath that the officer is gonna sign about tarnishing that badge and we'll release more information about it uh, next week. And, and the last area is uh, community engagement and community policing and developing those bonds of trust within the community. I think uh, this is the area that I'm most excited about. Anybody uh, who knows uh, me knows that I'm very uh, supportive and I'm very engaged in working with the community and creating partnerships. Uh, I think the most important program we're working on developing right now is our ambassador program and also the conversations that we've had recently. I don't know who's been able to watch our uh, town hall uh, with different groups from the black community and the authentic, strong uh, conversations we had with very difficult questions, but uh, we were there and we were there to answer those questions. And we want to continue these type of relationships uh, through our ambassador program and ensure that every group within the community, regardless of race, religion, uh, gender, uh, has a voice to the police department and a set of ears with the police department to listen. And, and our ambassador program is going to focus on four key concepts is number one, uh, being that ear for these community groups that sometimes didn't have a strong relationship with the police department. Number two, uh, learning uh, conflicts of culture and how those could affect law enforcement and how we could minimize uh, those conflicts. Number three, helping teach the department uh, new ideas about different cultures and, and ensuring that what they learned there is brought back to the department. And the fourth area is these ambassadors have to help us grow the diversity of the police department. And their goal has to be to work with these unique groups and ensure that we are generating applicants and uh, individuals from uh, these areas to come join the ranks of the Albuquerque Police Department. Uh, we've already selected our first round of uh, volunteers who wanted to be ambassadors and we'll be updating on that program in the near future. As for uh, crime fighting, 100% we have to continue to reduce crime. Uh, that's the number one priority for most citizens of Albuquerque. And we have to make sure that we're proactive and that we're, after all these years, we tear down uh, the silos and make sure that information flows freely upon the department. And the one big change I'll say in this area is uh, for the first time uh, this department, every commander involved in uh, reducing crime is on an 845 call every morning between uh, 845 and nine to go over the last 24 hours so that everybody's aware of all current investigations and uh, major issues that came up in the last uh, 24 hours. Uh, we'll continue that. I, we've seen great success with it. And uh, that's just one of those sense of internal communication. Uh, I know that uh, earlier uh, last month, uh, there was an issue. Uh, somebody tried to make an issue out of a video I had done in which I stated that I uh, uh, was going to transfer individuals to help assist with force investigations because it is part of the settlement agreement. And I stand behind that video and actually in the spirit of transparency, uh, I asked uh, our communication team to release every Friday video I release to our officers because I, I think it's important that we be transparent and that goes all the way and up through me. So uh, if anybody from the board would ever like to see what kind of messages uh, we're giving to our officers weekly, uh, they can be viewed online uh, in their entirety and unedited uh, version uh, so that uh, we could know what the message is uh, as a community from the leadership of the department to its officers. I think with that, uh, I'll stand for any questions. I'm excited to work with uh, Sylvester Stanley. Uh, he was in Hickory when I was in Laguna. Uh, we had a great working relationship then and uh, we assisted each other when we were able to and lent each other resources for training. But when he was at Isleta, I had reached out to all the tribal agencies uh, in an attempt for us to communicate more often 
especially those tribal agencies around Albuquerque who may be experiencing the same uh, issues as we are in Albuquerque. And uh, I look forward to our continued uh, strong relationship and, and that outside view being brought into the department. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. I did have a question for the Chief. Go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, first of all, congratulations, uh, Chief Medina. Uh, I know you, you you worked hard and that's kind of well-deserved based on everything I've seen that you attending other meetings I've been in as well. So congrats. Question I have is, and, and it's more of a concern as well as a citizen, uh, tax-paying citizen of Albuquerque, it seems that there's, um, there's a resistance to the restorative justice practices and processes um, in the community. Um, Tanya Covington, of course, is probably our guru uh, of, of us restorative justice, but she's reported on, on a couple of times where she's not even getting referrals from APD, uh, from, the, from the officers as far as um, uh, restorative justice sessions and things like that and referring youth as well as other people to, to that program. And so I guess my main question is, since, since you're now in place, you're not acting, you're now in place, how do you feel or can you give me your opinion on restorative justice and what you plan to, to do um, to, to make sure that we can, we can have uh, restorative justice as a part of the infrastructure for the city um, going forward to, to um, support community policing and uh, to, to send that as a center of excellence here and establish it independently as one. Can you tell me how you feel about that? You know, Eric, uh, I'm a firm believer in restorative justice. I'm a firm believer in diversion and not increasing the pipeline to a lifetime of criminality by putting somebody behind bars at a young age for uh, a low level crime. Uh, I think there are lines in the sand and when it becomes violent, I 100% uh, believe that at that point in time, we must intervene uh, as fully as possible to ensure that nobody loses their life or is seriously injured. And some of the things that I've done in my career uh, to help uh, show my commitment to these types of programs, uh, when I was uh, in charge of party patrol, uh, the vast majority, I would say probably about 95% of our tickets were dismissed once the child went to uh, a victim impact panel with Mothers Against Drunk Driving, for example. And when uh, we were asked to bring back a party patrol because we were seeing an increase in violence, one of the contingencies that I discussed and one of the programs that came out of that uh, with the late city councilor Ken Sanchez was uh, funding for Tanya's position. And I'm actually uh, one of the ones who recommended Tanya to be hired and I de helped develop the first stages of the RAD program. It went away from my area of responsibility for a period of time, but upon becoming interim chief, I asked that uh, we expand what its role was because it originally started as just for underage drinking. We added drag racing. I've been assured by Commander Langwood that they will be adding other low level crimes such as shoplifting and that program will continue to grow. But I think that it's also beyond that program. I was the first deputy chief to send uh, some of his employees uh, to uh, training for LEAD, uh, the county program for what I would consider a little higher level crime. Uh, we will continue to support and ask officers to make referrals. Uh, one of my area commands, Southeast, uh, mandated some for a period of time, but I haven't gotten an update in, in quite some time, but I'll look into that. And I've also sat in and become very familiar with uh, uh, Judge Cindy Leos's uh, young adult court and the impact that it has. And uh, to the point where I remember the first graduation I went to, and it involved a young man named Adrian, and he was one of their first graduates. And I tell the story of this young man to this day about how diversion changed the course of his life and how, how we have to look at the different types of diversion in, in order to make sure that we don't continue uh, to create career criminals, which affects us all. And I think that's part of our long-term solutions. So I will continue to look for ways. I think that we do have to have a community discussion and we do have to map out how these programs look. If you think of everything I described to you, it starts at a very low level misdemeanor sense. Uh, we've done some dabbling and some research on even at a high school level. And I think that we have to, as a community, map out the different levels of 
diversion and restorative justice and how it could look like from a high school student with very low levels to a young adult with very minimal crime to our first time property crimes offenders with, with possibly substance abuse problems on up to those that eventually get incarcerated, but how we could minimize the impact, lifelong impact of that incarceration through programs like Young Adult Court. I publicly supported uh, Young Adult Court in an open uh, editorial in the journal a while back. Uh, they mentioned my support of it. So I will continue to support uh, restorative justice and diversion programs because they truly are a way for us to create long-term uh, lasting solutions to some of our crime problems. Does that answer your, your question, Eric? It does, it does, thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions for uh, Chief Medina from the board? All right, then I'd like, uh, would, I'd like to turn this over to uh, Superintendent Stanley, please. Well, thank you, sir. Good evening. <clears throat> I'm honored to be here this evening and to be part of this team. Uh, I officially started to work Monday, so I won't have a report for you today, but tonight was basically just so you can get to meet me, know a little bit about me and, and my career in law enforcement. I've been in law enforcement 46 years. I started in the military. I'm also a retired first sergeant from the Army. Uh, but I've uh, spent 20 years in Bernalillo County Sheriff Department, I've been a police chief at three different uh, Indian country police departments and also three and a half years in the city of Gallup. I am really looking forward to this and I'm honored to be part of this team. I've known Chief Medina for a little while. Uh, I've known several members of the Albuquerque Police Department from having worked in the Sheriff Department. Granted, most of those people are probably retired now. Uh, but I'm looking forward to doing this. I'm looking forward to meeting the, uh, the staff that I'm going to be working with at the police department, which I have not done yet. Uh, but just so you know a little about me, uh, you know, I'm about professionalism, uh, being fair and having integrity about what we do. Uh, I've liked I've, all my adult life. I've been in law enforcement and we won't go into how old I am. But. We, we've done this a while, I believe, in the community, community policing, community outreach programs. Uh, hopefully, the uh, department will be able to get back in a national night out in August this year, just depend on the pandemic, because those things are very important. I will also have an open door policy. You can pick up the phone, contact me anytime. I'd be willing, more than happy to sit down and talk to you. Whether it's good news or bad news, I, I'll be there so we can discuss that. Uh, but I, I, I think I'm going to be a great asset to the team with my background and the experience uh, that we've had in law enforcement and some of the different programs. Uh, it hasn't always been a good time. I've seen bad times. Uh, 1982 is when I started in Bernalillo County Sheriff Department. They come a long way since then. 1976, I was in the police department in Kansas. In 1974, I was doing police work in Korea. So I've been around. Uh, I've had a couple of different things, but I'm really looking forward to this and the team that the mayor uh, has put together for this, his executive staff, and, uh, and get briefed on a lot of stuff. Like I say, I officially started to work Monday. I was invited to come here and introduce myself this evening. Uh, we made arrangements to be here so you guys can start getting to see me. Some of you might have seen me around. Yes, I ran for sheriff unsuccessfully. So some of you might have seen me around town before, but uh, I'm really looking forward to it. And so thank you for an opportunity just to tell you a little bit about me. And as time goes on in the next meeting, yes, we will have some type of report for you. I will have had a chance to meet with the staff, look at some of the shortcomings, have a chance to sit down with Chief Medina because we would definitely have a close communication problem. I understand somebody was concerned in the community if the chief was still gonna be involved. He's still a police chief and we have different roles that we're gonna be doing, but it's sort of like community policing. It's a partnership and that's just one part of the spigot. I'll be doing those things over internal affairs and training as he's doing the operation in the field. And as you guys are part of that partnership, 
as well. So we have community involvement from within the organization as well as out in the community. Thank you very much. I will stand for any questions if someone have any directly. Yes, thank you, uh, uh, Superintendent Stanley. And is there are there any questions from the board? Uh, or Director Harness. Thank you, Doctor Chair, Doctor Cass. Uh, congratulations to Chief Medina, uh, and then also Superintendent Stanley. Uh, my question is really about process. Uh, as uh, we here at the CPOA are making recommendations for discipline. Um, and given the uh, press conference that states uh, Superintendent Stanley is going to oversee discipline, um, I think it's imperative that we uh, have a meeting soon to discuss uh, the processes for our recommendations to come to you so that they don't run afoul of uh, uh, the timelines, uh, but the larger question is uh, what what remedy uh, have you discussed with the city and with the APOA uh, to satisfy the collective bargaining agreement, which says that uh, the chief has the final say for discipline? I have not had those discussions with the association or the city at this point in time. As I indicated, Monday will be the first official day. Uh, hopefully within the next couple of weeks, I can answer that, but I'd definitely be happy to sit down with you and make sure we don't miss any timelines. Uh, and it's, it will not be my intentions to violate the association contract to follow those rules, but I do need time to look at that, look at the present contract, look at your protocol and make sure we're within all the guidelines. The, the, uh, Ed, just to clarify also, the, the position of the uh, deputy chief administrative officer will give uh, the superintendent the authority to be able to make disciplinary decisions under the uh, under city's, city's guidelines and rules. So that's that will not be an issue. Uh, thank, thank you for that clarification. Any other questions? I Member, Member Mitchell, are you just scratching your nose? So. All right, so in, um, looking looking around, I, okay, I, I don't see any other hands up, so um, I'd like to thank you both for being here and uh, we appreciate the information. Uh, we wish you well going forward and uh, we're, we're looking forward uh, to the, you know, to the ongoing process of, of working, uh, working together, so. Um, you're, we're happy to have you and you're, you're, we're happy to have you stay if you like, but you're certainly free to leave. So thank you very much. So. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kess. All right, so moving along, we are now to uh, reports that were item um, 6A1, uh, the IA Professional Standards Division and the IA Force Division, and I'll let you uh, both submitted uh, written reports, but I believe they're here also to deliver those, uh, uh, to deliver their reports. So I will turn this over to whoever's next. Uh, Commander Cottrell, uh, Cottrell, is that you? I think I went first last month, Dr. Cass, so I'll let Commander Logo first this month. Okay, all right. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, Dr. Cass. Uh, board, glad to see you. Um, Again, for everyone who doesn't know, I'm Commander Lowe. I'm temporary duty over the Internal Affairs Force Division. And I know everyone got an update, but I wanna give a little bit more of a verbal one and also um, address board member Olivas' question from last month. So I think I can get uh, provide a little bit more update from them. So for the month of February, um, we did have 70 uses of force. We had 28 level ones, 27 level twos, and 15 level threes. Um, we did have a little bit of a spike as far as um, uses of force per 1,000 calls in the Northeast. Um, and then looking um, in there, you can see the majority of our level ones um, occurred in the Northeast with nine and in the Southeast with eight. Our level twos, our highest, were actually in the Northeast with seven. And our highest level 
uh, threes were shared between, uh, with four each with the Southeast and the Valley Area Commands. Again, with the highest types of calls for service that are likely to result in a use of force, continue to be the top five, which are family disputes, suspicious persons or vehicles, uh, then we have aggravated battery, and then we have behavioral health issues as well, along with suicide and disturbances. I was looking at the numbers from the different area commands. Um, again, I said we, we did go up in the Northeast um, with 17. Um, the Southeast is usually the highest. Um, they had 16 this month. And then it goes down from there to the Valley Area Command with 13. Foothills with 14, that's pretty high for them as well. And then Northwest and South, uh, Southwest um, seven and four respectively. I wanted to give a little bit more insight on Board of Levis's question last month when it talked about uh, levels, uh, number of uses of force in the Southeast Area Command specifically. Um, I did have the data analysts take a look in there and they are consistent from um, 2016 to, to current. So we have the annual use of force report from 2016, 17, 18, and 19, and that all include that. And it is very consistent with the Southeast. I looked at the different types of calls for service that would uh, that could potentially uh, lead to have a raise in use of force in the Southeast, which is aggravated assault again. They are number one in all of these area, um, these calls for service. So they have the highest numbers of calls for service um, in each of these. So it's aggravated assault with and battery, disturbance, family disputes, suspicious persons and vehicles, uh, and then suspicious persons. So there's, there's two different types. We have on-sites, which means that we, um, we created that contact, like uh, it's mostly traffic stops, right? So if we see um, a, a reasonable suspect, a probable cause to pull someone over, that's what we'll do. And then um, traffic stops just tend to have a higher rate of um, uses of force. So I hope that answers your question, uh, Board of Levis. I really wanted to make sure that we covered that and along with answering any other questions for February. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions for uh, Commander Lowe? And I might uh, add at this point, uh, we uh, I think we got a little off the agenda when I gave you the option of who goes first and GovTB has it, uh, I believe, uh, opposite to what it is. So just to clarify for the people who are watching, uh, this was the uh, use of force division or IAFD division that's uh, that's speaking. So are there any questions for uh, Commander Lowe? I have one. Um, as far as the use of force and the statistics that you just reported, how are they used as far as training and training adjustments and policies and standard operating procedures? Um, what are some of the cues that the trainers have for adjusting training to accommodate anything that may be considered problematic or, or they see... Um, any patterns of, of use of force that's not necessary? Of course. Um, we actually have a couple ways that we address that. Um, so on a quarterly basis, the Internal Affairs Force Division data analysts also provide a report to the training academy. So there is a full briefing between both divisions where we discuss um, any kind of trends and patterns that we've seen and anything that can be moved over into the training aspect of um, department wide, you know, we, we cover individual ones on a case by case basis. But once we see something that's systemic, that can be handled through a department, that's when we speak with um, Lieutenant Meisinger, um, Acting Commander Patterson in their group, and we determine if we can have some training added. Um, another additional added um, part in there. So every quarter as well, the data analysts report to the force review board. Uh, so the force review board, and it's actually twofold, is we provide the data like we have here, where we're just very, you know, overarching and we provide some information and then, but we also get into the details of the, um, the end results of each FRB. So that's how we're able to identify any additional trends and patterns in which we have to address it. Take a look at some of the referrals um, that come out of FRB, which do impact policy, training, supervision, tactics, and uh, equipment. And a lot of, we do have a fair amount of referrals coming out for training and policy specific um, related to these use of force cases. Um, and I don't know if um, Lieutenant Meisinger wants to jump on a little bit more because I think it really, uh, there's a, an important part when it comes to the use of force data and how we apply it to future training. Yes, Lieutenant Meisinger, go ahead if, you're, if you have something you'd like to add. Sure, I can, 
uh, add a couple points to it. Yeah, it's it's the the information that's provided uh, through all these data sources and all these units that deal with it throughout the department are really good in helping us to shape um, in a, a general uh, beginning picture of what we're looking at. Uh, we can then uh, take that information from raw data and we can start looking at uh, discussing it with people that are actually going through it because we do get. If somebody makes a mistake or if a squad wants more uh, or individual wants more clarification, uh, we provide uh, either mandatory or just additional training to them. And that gives us an opportunity to interview people to figure out and try and paint that complete picture about how we can do better about delivering the message and in what format. Uh, prime example is, is in the development of the use of force training that, that we talked about recently that's going on right now. Um, one of the areas that we knew we needed to add additional clarification into going forward from that was exactly how people are supposed to document what reviewers are going to be looking for um, as officers document their use of force incidents. So we were able to coordinate with the force division so that when they do the training, we can have them write a use of force report and then have it analyzed immediately and get the feedback as to telling them this makes sense or it doesn't make sense and, and what's a clear path forward. So that's just one example of how we come together as a whole, on a, as a department, to design trainings based off of what the needs are and how we can plan that path to success for everyone. Thank you. Any other questions for, uh, on the, to the IAFD uh, report? Uh, Member Olivas. Uh, yeah, I just want to. I just want to thank you for following up on that question from last month, and uh, I appreciate you looking back several years to to determine whether that was a a, a blip or a trend. And uh, I think you've you've done a good job of answering my question. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, any other questions? Uh, if there's no other questions for uh, Commander Bow, then the Commander Cottrell, please. Good evening, Dr. Cass and board members. Um, I'm Commander Zach Cottrell from Internal Affairs Professional Standards. Uh, I've provided my monthly report for February for internal affairs cases that were completed um, and sent that to everyone. Uh, just to go over it real quickly, um, total cases that were closed out um, within internal affairs, there were 12. And those cases are listed below with their findings um, and disposition if suspension or uh, reprimands were given in those cases. Um, we did close out 19 cases within internal affairs in the month of February, which is kind of high um, compared, especially to last month, which was only seven. Um, one of the major reasons for that is that um, I did have one detective that was out for two and a half weeks um, with COVID. So his cases um, were granted 30 day extensions by the chief. So those were all finished up in the last uh, month in February. Um, so that's why there's a little bit of spike there of closed out cases. Um, going over new cases that came in in the month of February, we opened 14 new ones that were kept in IEPS, which is about average. Um, 35 were sent to the area commands for their investigation. Um, that number has actually seen a downward trend over the last few months. Um, back in November and December, we were looking at around 50 to 60 cases that were being sent to the area commands. Um, so a lot of those minor misconduct cases look like um, we're not getting as many right now, um, which could be a good trend on the department. Um, could be that some of these um, trainings that we're talking about right now are getting through to the officers. Um, so a lot of the low level stuff, such as seat belting prisoners, um, calling out mileage, stuff like that, that would be investigated by the area commands is being addressed and um, we're not getting repeat offenders by officers. Um, we did carry 15 cases over from February uh, into March um, that are being investigated now. Um, something uh, to bring up what uh, Member Nixon asked uh, Commander Lowe uh, to go along with that. We also look for trends in cases. Um, we do uh, training referrals as well when we identify problems in cases. Um, we do refer this to the Academy in the exact same fashion. Um, for training on such as search and seizure or use of force training that we identify as well in any of our cases. Um, but we do look for those trends. Um, we do bring it to uh, their attention as well. Um, so we try and, uh, as the DOJ likes to put it, we're kind of a poor man's early warning system um, for the department. 
Uh, if we do see um, problems in certain areas, we are able to bring it to the attention, um, not only the executive staff, but training and other areas. Um, so that's all I have for this month. Um, if there's any questions. Yeah, I have a question. On those, okay. on those low level uh, type of uh, incidents that you refer back to the area commands, are those gone over in all the briefings or are, which would be different than waiting for a training opportunity? Um, so, I mean, would that be something that would happen routinely where, so you could kind of ab avoid maybe an officer in another area command who may not be the subject, but may also be in a situation that would be similar? Um, I can't speak for what the area commanders do, but um, that is a good idea. And something we've talked about is um, Force does a monthly newsletter out to all the officers with trends that they're seeing. Um, to bring to their attention and kind of a way to fix it. We've discussed doing the same thing. Um, so I think that might actually even address it that what you're bringing up as well is doing a monthly newsletter of trends that we're seeing in, in internal affairs in cases um, in, in interviews stuff that's brought up. So that could address that problem as well as just doing a routine monthly um, newsletter to catch it before it has to go all the way to a training uh, recommendation. So that's something I can definitely work on, sir. Thank you. Uh, other questions uh, for Commander Cockrell? I have a question if uh, no one else has one immediately. Um, that is, what have you identified what the major uh, issue is associated with termination of an officer? I mean, whether it's a training issue or whether it's a personal issue uh, or, or something else. So I, I'm curious as to what um, what leads most commonly to termination. I would say our highest rate of termination is untruthfulness, sir. Um, in truthfulness in a report or untruthfulness in their interview within internal affairs. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, any other questions? Ah, oh, Member Galloway. Sorry, technical difficulties over here. Thanks, Dr. Kess. Hi, Commander Cottrell. Um, this may be a super unfair question to ask you, so I'm gonna apologize in advance and understand completely if you have no insight to this whatsoever. Um, but one of the ideas that we have at a subcommittee level, level have kind of toyed with is seeing about um, sending back low level complaints Things like, for example, um, a complaint about an officer not wearing a mask to the area command so that it frees up our investigators' time to focus on the, on the weightier complaints that may involve disciplinary action or um, maybe violating a citizen's rights, whatever that may be. Do you have a sense as to whether or not that might be manageable at the area command level if they've got the, the time available to do those sorts of um, minor complaints? Um, thank you for the question, ma'am. I have actually talked to Director Harness about this before. Um, I do think that that is a possibility. Um, I, and I agree with you. I think that would free up Director Harness's investigators to look into some of the bigger, more complaints that you guys get that are a little more important to spend time on. Um, I don't see an issue with it. I think it's totally plausible. Um, you know, there, there was a time when I first came on the department that that's how those low level um, complaints were handled was at the area command level when they came in from citizens. So I don't see an issue with that at all, ma'am. Do you think the area commanders would feel comfortable managing that or would they feel like we're um, taxing their workload <laughs> already? I don't. Um, I actually think some of the area commanders would welcome it. Um, they do like to have that knowledge and control over the complaints with their officers. So they actually might welcome it, ma'am. And would that kind of information be captured somewhere to identify trends with minor issues? I believe so. Um, I believe that even these complaints, uh, CPCs are still tracked in IA Pro. So we would still be able to pull the information out of IA Pro to look for trends. Of course, okay, thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions for Commander Cottrell? Cottrell, I'll get it. I'll say it both ways, and I got you covered. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kass. All right, thank you very much for your presentations. And uh, I think we're now at item um, three, uh, which is the a report from the APD Training Com uh, Academy on APD crimes against children and domestic violence. So I, that looks like Lieutenant Meisinger is sitting upright. So if, if it's you, uh, go ahead, please. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh Acting Commander Patterson uh, apologizes. He got double booked for this evening, so he asked me to stand in for him. Um, he prepared a, a little bit of a, a slideshow here just to get help you guys kind of see some of the things uh, that are covered. Um, and of course, there's going to be opportunity for questions at the end because um, I'm not entirely sure that um, I will answer everything with the presentation, but I'll do my best. So uh, let me try and share a screen. Hopefully I do it right. I always seem to share the wrong one but that should work. Can someone, I can't see you guys once I click on this. So would someone please let me know if you all are seeing this presentation? Yes. I see it. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so uh, when I looked at this that he sent over, it, it largely covers what we um, end up training, to existing officers, uh, but I will touch on, so for in this instance, like uh, the CACU, Crimes Against Children, um, for new cadets, they receive a four hour block on CACU, uh, Child Abuse and Neglect, um, but then it continues on for the rest of their career. It is one of the state biennium uh, training requirements, and each of the, the topics that I'm gonna talk about are actual annual requirements. So while they get their four hours initially uh, carrying on every year, uh, we go in and, and there's some objectives about what we cover. So there's a, a, a two hours annually where we talk about what child abuse is. Um, we want people to understand the different kinds of child abuse, uh, the statutes, any updates to those, uh, legal requirements of what's involved when we actually have to remove a child from a home, because that's, that's obviously a pretty significant um, action and, and what the laws are and what's expected when we encounter that, as well as how to, how to navigate that and work with CACU to make sure that's done appropriate. Um, the re reporting requirements, there's, there's several levels of, of who needs to be notified when these things happen, as, be, as well as some of the dynamics um, concerning pedophiles. Uh, it's an uncomfortable topic, but it's a very important topic and something that every officer needs to know those nuances of. Um, as well as basic understanding and the dynamics of SIDS. It's important to know though that, that with our department, we're fortunate enough to have uh, of this size that we have detectives specifically devoted to crimes against children and another unit devoted to child exploitation. So they are specialists in this. And so what we wanna make sure that we're doing is we're providing the field officers and, and the general um, investigators on our department the tools to be able to see these things, recognize them, and get the ball rolling in the right direction. Um, and so that when they do call out these detectives, they are giving them as much information as they can, and it's getting handled in the most efficient and sensitive manner possible. Um, here's some things that we talk about. The, the, the state provides some great uh, flyers, and we expand on it in training, talking about how do you broach the topic if you're trying to talk to a child how do you do that in a way that, that is going to be the least intrusive, but um, the most impactful, where you're going to get as much information without re-traumatizing the kid so that we can start an investigation when it's necessary. As you go down, you can see on the slide, there's several of the points about how to do that. Uh, each of these in the classes are expanded upon uh, to help give officers those tools. Um, you know, as a prime example, the one on the bottom here, my wife works in early childhood education. One of the children she works with is um, barely two years old, but he's the size of a five or six year old. And so it's a common misconception that when adults encounter this child, they assume the child is delayed or they assume the child should have a much higher level of cognitive reasoning. That's something we want to make sure that officers are aware of, that there are children that develop at different rates. And so you can't make an assumption based off what you are seeing what you assume is an age and what you assume the person, the child should know, because they may look like a two-year-old and be seven, or they may be a seven-year-old and look like a two-year-old. It exists. And so those are little types of nuances that we need to make sure that they're aware of. 
um, as well as how to ask the questions. Again, these are some more things that are covered um, that we expand upon to make sure that officers are aware. They're basic interviewing techniques, but they're modified for children. Um, then we move on into uh, uh, dealing with victims of sexual assault. Uh, in the academy, the cadets receive three hours of training. Um, then moving on from that, um, don't have it on the, the slide, forgive me, but um, we do continue on again with um, biennium training when it, when it comes to this. This is, these are the, uh, um, uh, this class right here is because of the nature of, of sexual assault cases, sometimes there can be um, more to it. So similar to why we have our crisis intervention training, and then we have our ECIT officers that receive an enhanced level of training. This is one of the courses that we have dealing with uh, victims of sexual assault, where this is a specialty class, this uh, advanced stalking, homicide, avoidance, and law enforcement. Um, this is one of those things that can give detectives and officers a little bit extra knowledge and some better tools to help identify issues and, and take these calls and be able to help the community a little bit better. Uh, this isn't something that every officer gets, but it is a tool that's available and the officers are aware that these special certified officers exist on the department and they're available to help when needed. Um, the, uh, the, as I mentioned, the, the basic cadets received the, the three hours of training. Um, but then again, it is in, we have a one hour requirement in our biennium training when it comes to this. Some of the areas that we have to cover or that we do cover are listed along in here uh, where we talk about um, how do we handle the situation? There was a time back many, many years ago when it, you'd go in and it would be a domestic violence situation that was difficult to address and, and officers uh, way back this before I was on the department, but they would arrest both parties in some instances, because they would be mutually fighting. That's discouraged. Uh, we, we don't, we, we got to figure out where the, we don't want the victim to be re-victimized re because they were defending themselves. So we have to ask more questions and we have to get to the root cause of it and help that uh, path of healing exist and, and start right then from that moment. Um, we train officers, as you can see in their five key the indicators associated with domestic violence calls for service wherein there's a 50% likelihood, likelihood that officers will be assaulted. That's important to know. One of the big topics that we talk about is use of force. So there are certain things that when an officer gets a call, they should see the information on this call and our dispatchers are trained to ask certain questions along the way. So when officers get that information, they go, ah, oh, you know what? I need to approach this call a little safer. It doesn't mean that a use of force is imminent. It just means in order to prevent it, I need to take certain steps walking into it where everybody can be safe because we don't want to get hurt and we don't want the public to get hurt. So if we take certain precautions, then we can greatly mitigate the chance of a use of force happening. So that's important to explain to the officer. Um, then we talk about, again, you know, the interviewing techniques, they, they change a little bit for every case. So dealing with someone who is experiencing trauma and how to get honest uh, statements from people when investigating these on scene, that's important. Uh, then um, some of the other things uh, in, in dealing with domestic violence, I want to break it out a little bit more um, for the cadets, totally for cadets. Um, sorry, I'm talking 100 miles an hour. It's a long week. If I misspoke on something, please ask me the question to clarify later. But for the cadets for domestic violence, in total, it's 20 hours of training. Um, it's broken down eight hours for DV, two hours for victims assistance and human trafficking related things, two hours for ensuring child safety, which domestic violence often involves kids. And that's something we don't wanna overlook is if we, somebody has to go to jail or if there is um, a domestic violence situation that just needs to be dealt with in general, we gotta look out for the kids too. And even if it's a domestic violence situation away from the home where kids aren't present, it's important that officers are asking if kids are involved because are there children waiting at home that walked home from school and are expecting mom or dad to come home and feed them dinner? We have to ask those questions and we have to make those accommodations so those kids are cared for. We can't forget about them. So that's an important class that we do. And that one is also a one hour annual requirement. Um, we do uh, with cadets, we do an entire day of DV related scenarios so that they can hone these skills to figure out exactly how to, to deal with all the things that I've mentioned, 
um, in the safest way possible when they get out and they start taking calls for service. Um, are there, I'll eliminate that screen, hopefully I can do it right. I can. Okay. Am I back on or you guys still see my screen? Still see your screen. Should be something up there, there to stop sharing. Sure. There system. it is. There okay. Um, I don't want to eat up too much time. This is a huge topic that we could talk about for, for many hours, but I uh, wanted to give you kind of a basic overview of some of the things that we do cover in the training as, as requirements and just some of the topics and things that are important. Um, what questions might you guys have that I can answer for you? Remember Galloway. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Kess. All right. <laughs> so um, I appreciate the refresher on the Crimes Against Children's training. Um, it's very similar to what we heard back in August, but I really appreciate the uh, kind of peek under the hood for domestic violence and sexual assault calls. So thank you for that. Um, I did specifically have some questions about crimes against children, just follow-up questions to the presentation six months ago or so, or roughly at that point. Um, when we spoke last, there were about, I, I think you'd mentioned about 40, 41 officers out of nearly 400 that had received that additional CARES training, that specialized training that you had talked about for the, for the kiddos. Um, I know you know, but I just want to make sure anybody else who may be listening is aware. Um, Lieutenant Sanders mentioned a goal of 100 field officers being trained in CARES. Um, where do things stand in meeting that goal? Have, has there been any forward motion? I actually don't have those numbers. I apologize. Okay. Uh, I, I didn't, wasn't anticipating that question. I didn't reach out and ask him that. So. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's just see what we've got here. Um, Ha, ha, one of the other things that he had mentioned was identifying a list of officers that they believed were um, better suited for that type of training. Do you have any idea if that's happened? No, we, we coordinate that, that training specifically through them because they are the specialists on that. Um, uh, we just work with them on making sure that we're there, we're documenting um, who it is and what certifications they have. Um, but to, even teach those courses, they have to have a high level of, of training certifications. Um, and those all exist within that Crimes Against Children unit. We don't have the trainers here at the academy. So I, I unfortunately, I don't have those numbers for where we stand on handpicking those individuals. Okay, okay. Um, he had mentioned something about a specialized bid system to better disperse those officers that have received that training across the area commands and the shifts? Do you know if anything's happened with that? I don't, that would be something we'd have to bring him in. If you want those specific things about that care pro cares program, those are yeah. questions that are gonna have to go to him. Okay, all righty. Um, uh, this one, maybe you know, maybe you do know this one uh, that you guys had hired or created a permanent position for a videographer that yes. could maybe record those trainings and make them available to officers. Because I don't know if you'll recall the, the reason that I brought this up back in August is that I was on a, on a ride along and mm -hmm. there, were, there was a team, a whole squad of people that sat down with me and said, this is a problem. We don't feel as though we're trained enough and we will sit on a call and sit on a call and sit on a call and keep our fingers crossed that somebody who does feel confident will pick that up. And so the idea of providing that training and making sure that as many officers as possible feel confident to take those calls is kind of the goal, right? So, yes. okay. A any idea if that video has been made and if it's available? It has not. Um, we've had with the other uh, major things of dealing with uh, use of force trainings and um, other state requirements. We have delivered a number of these trainings last year because of the COVID restrictions that our videographer was, uh, basically our training was almost exclusively online. And so he was continually working to get all these state trainings and, and what we could get together for the CASA trainings and things developed and put out. Um, that 
video format and like what we had talked about in doing that has proven to be very successful because it's freeing us up to do more targeted training in person. Mm -hmm. And so that, that individual, um, Mr. Williams, our, our videographer is, is booked and very, very busy. So we've made that request to get him some help to where he's got other people in, in working for him that can help us do things like you're talking about recording the trainings so that he's doing the higher level editing, um, crafting these videos, um, playing editor and, and director, if you will. And we get other people that can help you with the actual just going out and running the cameras and, and getting the footage for these videos. So it, it, it is important. It's still something we're pushing forward on. And um, the department has um, accepted our, our proposals for that. And so we're moving forward and adding extra bodies to help him. Okay. Thank you so much. Those are, that's literally the extent of my questions other than is there somebody that might be able to provide us with updates on those questions that you are not able to answer? We'd have to reach back out to Lieutenant Sanders and um, I can, I can send him an email and, and try and get some information and forward it along to you all. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you. And any other questions? I remember Amia Pruitt, I thought you had your hand up at the same time. I did. Thank you, Dr. Cass. Um, thank you for the presentation, um, Lieutenant Meisinger. Um, one thing I'm curious about, and it's sort of something that Member Galloway just mentioned, is the idea of um, you know, folks getting, get, officers getting, seeing that call come out and, and sort of feeling uncomfortable with answering it. Um, I'm wondering if, do you guys track that type of thing? Like how long certain types of calls might take to get picked up um, in that hesitation um, period? Because I, I had a similar um, experience in, in one of my ride-alongs as well. And, um, or, or if there's any kind of survey done of officers with like how confident they feel on some of these more, um, I guess, you know, so many of these, things that they're re responding to are sensitive issues, but this seems to be one that, that at least we experienced the, um, folks saying that they felt uncomfortable with it. Um, wondering if you guys track that or address that in any way directly. We do get some information from dispatch about uh, how long calls hold, uh, what types of calls come in. Um, and we do have our, uh, um, um, Blanking on the name right now, our analysts, the 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 data Kara's group, the data, the data people that will pull stuff. Commander Lowe, if you're laughing, you can feel free to jump in and, and fill in uh, on these blanks. But they they uh, they collect information, they disseminate things to us. Uh, we get uh, scorecards from the area commands that talk about where they're at on certain things, that, as well as the some of the data breakdowns in addition to the force numbers. Uh, so those do exist. Um, and those, those higher level analytics, um, I, I, we will continue to get better with them as we continue to kind of get the staff and the processes down. Um, we are constantly improving over here at the Academy at looking at what data exists, what numbers exist and what that we don't know about, can we get to improve on things? Uh, every time we sit down and we start to analyze what we want to do for upcoming trainings or why we need to do certain trainings, we think of new things as to where can we look to figure out the condition that we're in and a measurable uh, data point that we can actually gauge the success of a training or the need for a training. So that is, that is one. Honestly, I'll tell you right now that the response times and the call holding times not one that I've actually really used uh, so much comparatively to call for service volume just in general and relate that to um, uses of force and misconduct and test scores, really. Because if we de de deliver a class, I wanna see that the officers understand the material. And if on the test they're telling me they understand it, um, but then we're getting mandatory trainings or referrals or requests for refreshers, then that tells me maybe they, they didn't. Um, so those are kind of the areas that we're looking at now. Uh, one, one more follow-up I'm curious about is that if, if officers, so I, I understand how you, know, you can target for their training based on complaints or, or some kind of deficiency that's been identified. Um, but I'm wondering, it, 
is there an avenue for folks who just feel like they don't have enough training and it's not a um, it's not a punitive measure or a, I mean, I know you're not trying to frame these as punitive measures to begin with, but um, where someone can say, does it, is there an avenue for someone to say, hey, I really, I'm uncomfortable with this and I'd really like more training. Mm -hmm. Can Absolutely. they just request further training? Yes, yes, they can. Um, we have a internal process where people can reach out. We've tried some different things using different kind of websites and things where they can click in and request stuff. Um, but uh, as the systems in our department evolves in the computer programming and whatnot, there will be, there will be a efficient, more efficient way, but it exists right now where anybody can reach out and say, Hey, I want more training. And we do that regularly. Um, one thing that, that we have done just prior to trying or starting the, the tier four, the use of force training we just did is we actually went out and, went to field squads and asked them or in some detective units and said, what would you like training in? And we brought them in as a group um, over to our reality-based training center. And we put them through training. Each of them had a little bit of a different topic, but we were able to utilize our existing trainings, develop scenarios or to um, go over, just have that one-on-one -on -one small group discussion over things that they felt they need more clarification for. And uh, we got really, really positive results from that. Everyone enjoyed it. And we know that's an area we want to improve on. Um, but as you, or as I mentioned before, that reality-based training, doing scenarios and things is very manpower intensive. We have to bring in for like this tier four, a huge amount of people to make that happen. We just added an extra person to our RBT staff. And we're hoping to continue to grow that because as we move forward and we get out of say this training, that's something that we want to do more of. We want to have that roll call training where squads can brief and they can come in or they can reach out and just say, um, this is what I would like to do. And our doors are open. We can bring them into one of our training facilities and we can cover the topics that they want clarification on. And then when we start realizing, hey, there's more than a few squads that are asking for the same thing, that tells me there's a department need for it. And then we can look at how we can get that out quickly. Um, but it, that avenue does exist and uh, Every day we're improving that process. Thank you. Any other questions for uh, Lieutenant Meisinger from the board? I did. Uh, I yes, did. go ahead, Member Nixon. Thank you. So um, one of the concerns that, that I see, and it's not just in the media, but overall is that it seems to me like the, the, the swindling for um, police officers has gotten wider. Um, where, you know, it blurs a line between social work, uh, mental health worker, slash psychiatrist, slash therapist, and, and going into this. So I guess for clarity's sake, what is the end game? You've got a lot of training that you're giving the cadets. Um, what, what are you, what is the outcome? What are you trying to, to um, uh, train that cadet to do when they're encountering these, you know, domestic violence, sexual assault, mental health, type of um, um, calls so that the, what that outcome is, because I, I know that they're not, you know, they're police officers at the end of the day, they're police officers. And so the purpose of this training is to ensure that what happens? Well, ultimately police officers are there to enforce the law. I mean, that is our fundamental function and that is what we do. But you hit the nail on the head when you said that's not the only thing we do. So one of the things that we, we really, really try and hammer home is that while we are there to enforce the law, we also have to approach every situation with empathy and understanding. The community is often left in a situation where they're at wit's end. Uh, they don't call the police most often to say, hey, I had a great day. They call them when they're having a bad day or they flag us down when they're frustrated and say, you know, I just don't know what to do. Uh, so we really hammer home with our cadets and we really try and sell the message with officers throughout their career that we are problem solvers and, and we are uh, supposed to be that symbol of hope for the community. We may not be solid waste, but they may say, you know what, I've been trying to get that trash out of that lot next to my house and there's a lot of you know illegal activity that goes on in that lot and I'm frustrated and I don't know what to do. Sure, we can go there and we can arrest people, but until that 
couch in that you know living room gets moved out of the empty lot that everyone goes to to, to commit crime, it's going to continue. So we try and provide the cadets and the officers with those problem solving skills saying, who can do that? How can I get a hold of somebody that comes down to that problem oriented policing where we bring the community together and the city resources together to say, hey, why don't we do a cleanup in that lot? Um, and we teach them on that problem oriented policing. We went through a uh, 16 hour training last year on community oriented policing and problem oriented policing with every officer. It's something we deliver to our cadets now as they come up teach them, kind of give them a path on how to do that. How do you be that community organizer? Where do you connect uh, citizens with resources? And, and then that way we can focus ultimately, if we're able to do that and bring those different community resources together to, to solve a problem together, um, then we're all gonna succeed. Because then we can focus on our job of eliminating crime while we can count on the other resources in the community to do different aspects of that and, and provide those resources along. So, I mean, in these specific topics, bringing in um, groups like Parnalos Ninos for the Children, there's, there's many other uh, domestic violence resources and shelters uh, uh, that, that are available. Uh, I have a very close friend that deals with uh, victims and domestic violence. And so getting in the resources that are available through there uh, it's important that we make sure that people are aware of what exists and and how to connect these victims with the resources so that they can get themselves out of that situation. Thank you. And, and I'd like to thank you again as well. And uh, are there any other questions from the, uh, from the board? That I would like to I think we're ready to wrap this up if there are none. I would like to mention that uh, we're happy uh, 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 Superintendent Stanley to uh, give give you this chance to meet your staff uh, because this almost everyone here I think is uh, is associated with your new uh, with your new division so um, I think it's wor certainly worked out well for the board I, and I, I hope this is a uh, hope it's working out for you too so thank you very much yes I'm looking forward to it sir so our, seeing no further questions uh, from the board, we'll move on. I thank you again. And of course, you're free to, you're free to leave the meeting uh, now, that you're, now that you're done. You can uh, go uh, spend, you know, spend some time at home in an you know, unofficial capacity. So thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, so we are um, to the next item on the agenda, which is report from city council. So I believe that's um, Mr. Sylvan, please. Thank you, Chair, Dr. Cass, honorable board members, Chris Sylvan with the city council. My first update, well, my only update is we at the committee, the committee that picks the board members, we have three candidates and one of the candidates, I got him scheduled with two of the counselors at the end of next week and two of the counselors at the beginning of the following week. And I have this ambitious, aggressive plan to try to get this person on the agenda by April 5th. And I'm gonna be reaching out to the, um, the outreach committee. Member Galloway, I'll be reaching out to you so we can put this person in front of you guys. Hopefully sometime late next week or early the week after that. So we're going to get this thing moving. That's the good news that I have. So any questions on that aspect? Any questions for Mr. Sylvan? The uh, lineup changed. So I have to look around a little more carefully here. So, all right. So thank you. Uh, and we're happy, uh, we, we think that's good news. So um, we're looking forward to uh, seeing, the, seeing the candidates you present. So, all right, uh, we are at item C, which is public safety committee. So if you're, you're back Thank on. You, Chair. Thank you, Chair, Dr. Cass, board members, Chris Sylvan again, with the public safety committee report. The Public Safety Committee met this past week, March 9th, and 
There was one item on the agenda. It was EC-21-269, which is the Albuquerque Community Safety Department ACS quarterly report. And the motion was received be noted and it carried all the counselors voted for it. So it's moving to full council. Also at that meeting, um, Mariela Angel Rees gave a presentation on where the ACS department is in this process. And that was the only item from public safety. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Uh, seeing no hands. Um, I'm sorry, report from the mayor's office. Uh, Pastor Walker, is that you? Thank you, Dr. Katz. I, I do have a report that I would like to share with you. I guess it's already been shown, but as uh, we all know, the announcement of the new leadership team has been uh, made throughout the uh, community in the city of Albuquerque. And we are looking forward, we're glad that the mayor has made the decision in his selection of uh, Chief Medina as well as uh, Superintendent Stanley. Throughout the last several months, I'll just share with you that I've had the opportunity to meet with uh, just about every CPC in the city. And one of the things that I've uh, shared with the CPCs that I've met with is how important it is uh, that uh, the community policing councils in the police department, the mayor's office, have a cooperative and a collaborative uh, relationship. It's very important when the people in the community in the Albuquerque Police Department work together to build that trust and confidence by developing those strategies and techniques to address the concerns in the issues of all the citizens of Albuquerque. And we are striving to do the very best that we can. We are proud uh, that of the selection that have been made. And we again guarantee the council and the COPA that we will continue working, uh, that we will continue to have the relationship and the communication that we've had in the past so that we can continue to further uh, the uh, life in which we live in the city of uh, Albuquerque. Any questions? Uh, are there any questions for Pastor Walker? If seeing no questions, we will thank you. Thank you for your presentation and we'll move on to item E, which is the city attorney report from the city attorney. and board members. I have three items to discuss with you this afternoon or this evening. Um, the first is that Mr. Aguilar from the city attorney's office continues to work with um, city count, I'm sorry, with, um, well, yes, with city council, but also with the Department of Justice and the monitoring team to uh, help to ensure that in the future, there are not delays in appointment of board members. Uh, the second item is that on uh, February 26th, uh, we had our hearing at which the court addressed the city's, the, city, um, the city's motion, joint motion with the Department of Justice for employment of an external force investigation team. The court did approve that order and um, the city published the request for notice um, of letters of interest on the city's webpage on March 5th. And I'm going to put a link to that um, where it is posted in the chat for you all. Uh, the city is continuing to work on uh, meeting with the, inter the, inter uh, the independent monitoring team to work on the uh, technical assistance required by the order and to work toward um, developing better processes within internal affairs as required by the order. 
Uh, the final item, and let's see where is it? The final item is uh, that we are, I'm working to end meeting, have met, had one meeting thus far with um, Mr. Maurer and one meeting with um, Mr. Harness and Ms. Kuntz uh, to try to come up with an agreement that will help you all get uh, videos when you need them after a forced reboard meeting more quickly. So that's still early, but we are hoping to come to some sort of agreement that will be compliant with the collective bargaining agreement and the ordinance to ensure that you all get what you need. I know that today um, APD did send a link to some materials from the uh, case you all requested. Although I've checked that link, I'm not sure that it had the videos. And so I'm still going to be working to ensure that you all get that. And I've asked that internal affairs have a representative present next month to meet with you um, just to make sure that that process is working, that ha has worked or is working out for you all. Um, those are all of my updates. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Member Mitchell. Um, yeah, maybe this is common knowledge, but it, I'm not familiar with it. But is there any kind of benchmark dates about when the CASA would end and the involvement with the DOJ would end? And if the answer is yes, have those been modified or extended since we started? And what, what is the end game? When do we look to see that we're where we need to be? Sure. Um, the initial goal as set forth in the CASA was that we would be done within four years. However, we don't just get to be done within four years. We have to meet 95% um, compliance with the requirements of the paragraphs of the CASA and we have to uh, maintain compliance for two years in order to get to that point. So at this point, um, and this is still consistent with the city's previous um, motion that we ended up with a drawing um, regarding uh, finding the city to be um, in sustained compliance with certain paragraphs. Um, many of the paragraphs that we are in operational compliance with, we've been in compliance with for over the two years already. So um, those, those paragraphs, um, unfortunately, are not the use of force and the training academy and those types of paragraphs. So we're working on getting all of the paragraphs into operational compliance. Um, it is the belief and intention of this external force investigation team process that we will, that, that will really kickstart the improvements required to get us into operational compliance. Um, within the next year with regard to those paragraphs. Uh, so, you know, the Academy still is working to, to get caught up on this trainings. COVID was uh, particularly challenging for the Academy and, and trying to change to delivering trainings that are really intended to be delivered in person via online. And then that sort of remote platform was a big challenge for the Academy. Um, and we, they ran into additional problems as well um, with the change in leadership that was required at the academy. Uh, so we're working on it. And at the end of the day, we have to show um, sustained compliance for two years. So best, ba best case scenario would be three more years if I'm understanding what you're saying? That's a fair assessment. Um, not, it would be three years from today because of the way that the monitors reports come out. We have to, ha we would start counting at the date the monitors report puts us in operational compliance and there is a bit of a delay. And I apologize, my, my computer just keeps blinking on and off. I don't know if my internet connection is unstable. We can hear you, but you're frozen in time. Okay, I apologize. All right, well, thank you. Any other questions? Oh, you're back, you're back live now. Okay. All right, so any other questions for uh, Ms. Van Meter? Uh, Member Galloway. Um, do you have, I'm sure we heard about this when it happened, but I'm having trouble recalling the details as to why prospective board candidates are now meeting with each of the city councilors um, before they are confirmed. 
You know, I don't have that information and I'm not sure if Mr. Sullivan might have that information, but um, I apologize. I do not. I'm also going to just turn off my camera, but I'm still here just to try to help my connection here. Chris, do you know anything about that? I know you weren't in that role when that happened, but. Chair Cass, board member Galloway. Um, I have no idea. I'm just doing what was done in the past. I know that Councillor Winter and Councillor Jones have been interested in meeting with the prospective candidates before they come to the board. And I, I guess that's just a process of trying to get to know them. I'm not sure if board member Nixon or board member Armijo Pruitt, Pruitt, I can't talk today, or board member Mitchell did that process, but. I didn't. You know, Okay. I, I didn't meet with any council member. Okay. I didn't meet I, with a council member either. I just met with and, the board. Yeah, I, I met with, with yeah. Councillor Winters yeah. and, and Joe. You met with Councillor Winter. Okay. I'm just wondering, because I know that we've kind of been um, kicking around ideas as to why there's such a delay in process. And I wondered how much meeting with councillors is adding to that delay. It may be an insignificant amount of time. Just curious if you had any of that. Thanks. Chair, Dr. Cass, board member Galloway. Um, right now, um, Chair Dr. Cass is on that committee as well as I believe um, Lindsay is on that committee as well, uh, Ms. Van Meter, that we're just trying to figure out how to streamline the process. I know that um, Mr. Aguilar is on that committee, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be meeting tomorrow with Elizabeth Martinez of the DOJ as well to try to streamline the process and not have this take so long. So I'm kind, of under the, I'm kind of under the impression that all of the different CPCs have their own way of electing or, or selecting or bringing on board committee members. Is that a true statement or is there like a checklist or standard operating procedure they're supposed to follow? Uh, uh, Councilmember Nixon. Uh, yes, the CPCs at this point do have a different way. Each council has a different way of uh, nominating members. We're trying to streamline that a little bit, but there's a bit of a discussion as to how much they want that streamlined. Thank you. So are there any other questions for uh, uh, the uh, for the city attorney, if if uh, if not, we can move on to the CPCs, where maybe this you can take up this question, however you however you want to deal with it. Um, so um, we are then at item F, which is the report from the CPCs. So, Mr. Menza, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Dr. Cass. We've been pretty busy this month. We've had a lot a lot of uh, things going on. So uh, just to give you some idea about what's been happening in our meetings. Uh, we had a facilitated meeting on February 16th, which was to settle the dispute between a couple of uh, uh, council members, which uh, which uh, snowballed a little bit more than it should have. And we came out with a good uh, understanding of each other on that one. Uh, on February 14th, we got uh, presentations from detectives uh, Rahimi and Wolfbrandt uh, on investigative services and also uh, special investigations from uh, Lieutenant Bernard. In the Valley Council on February 25th, we had a panel on EFIT with um, Ed, with uh, DOJ Attorney uh, Elizabeth Martinez, District Commander Garcia, and uh, Commander Jonathan Brown that went well. And uh, Lieutenant Meisinger also did a presentation on APD's use of force training. We had our strategic planning and review meeting, which was invited of all CPC members on 227. And we came up with five areas of importance. That was um, diversity and inclusion, marketing and branding, accountability, operational efficiency, and sustainability and collaboration and partnership. Those are the five areas. We got specific goals on each of those five, which we are working for. We've had two of those committees actually meet again to uh, speak toward moving toward the goals in a timely manner. And uh, we came up with a mission statement for the uh, community policing councils, which is uh, 
The mission of the Community Policing Council is to communicate, collaborate, and build trust, leading to safer community-oriented policing. Okay. We had a session between myself and the uh, CPC chairs on the 28th, in which they would have a chance to speak to me and uh, tell me what their grievances are and what they would like to accomplish individually. We spoke about uh, what we can spend our budget on, what is most necessary, how the five councils should work together, and uh, my idea in forming an elder council of uh, ex-council officers who no longer want to work in their council but want to have a citywide application. We're going to speak about that in the Council of Chairs at the end of the month. And uh, on the third, we have the Southwest CPC in which uh, Lieutenant David Baca, Sergeant Peter Silva, uh, Stephanie McMillan, Chris Patterson, and uh, David Salley then talk about recruiting. They gave numbers. They spoke about in-person recruiting as opposed to um, online recruiting, which, which the department is doing more of now. And then we had a spirited Q&A with, uh, with the public, went very well. On March 8th, uh, Commander Langwood uh, spoke about the mission of the APD Investigations Unit in the Foothill CPC. And Jerry Bachicha and Angel Garcia spoke about the Violence Intervention Program, what their mission is and what they hope to accomplish. On uh, March 9th, the Northeast CPC had a presentation from DA Raul Torres about the composition of crime, crime prevention and uh, intervention. And uh, Lieutenant Greg Weber spoke about the use of force statistics and uh, Lieutenant Salinan once again about recruiting numbers. And on March 11th, um, I met with, uh, with the chief today and um, she talked about having Jennifer, he talked about having Jennifer Garcia in charge of communication from APD with the councils and uh, also some objectives that will strengthen ties with the CPCs. I'm going to make a report on that later. We changed wording on the web page about removing voting members because we no longer vote on recommendations. We automatically pass them through, even if they're from the public. And we changed that to council members. That was important to a few of the uh, council chairs. Um, we updated all past minutes from July 2020. A few of them were still in draft status. And uh, we've added a new chair and co-chair in two councils, the Southwest and the Southeast, and a new co-chair in the Northeast as well. And we have elected five new council members. Any questions? That's it? <laughs> <laughs> You've been busy. It's been a slow month. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. Um, I uh, I'm looking for oh member Levis. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's yeah. As everyone else said, that's a full report. Uh, sounds sounds like you've you've done a lot of good work. A lot of a lot of uh, you know catching up and and filling things in where where they needed to be and. Uh, I, I, as a former CPC member, I, I, you know, I have a special place in my heart for that, that work. And I appreciate what you're doing there and uh, giving some stability and some, some much needed um, help to that, that area of our uh, community policing program here. Um, I guess what I wanted to comment on and, and uh, just ask for you, you know, I realize you can't, you can't force anyone here to, to do anything, but I wanted to encourage you to uh, reach out to the council of chairs about uh, working on an MOU between the, uh, the CPOA, the executive director and the, the council of chairs or the CPCs. That's something we discussed in, in one of our personnel meetings. And uh, I know that I saw that was actually specifically mentioned um, in, I believe it was your report that that, that hadn't occurred yet. And um, certainly if there's any resources that are needed or, or anything like that, I, I hope that you'll You'll help them with that, and it certainly sounds like you 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 will, and you're you're more than capable. But uh, I just wanted to mention that, and hopefully you can relay that to them that, that we are still interested in, in getting their feedback. But I want to make sure that that there's a, a mutual understanding there before um, before we ask any any more. We've got our council of chairs in two weeks, so I will certainly bring that up. Any other questions? Uh, all right, then we'll move on to uh, 
report from the APOA. And I see no one here from the APOA, so we will move on to report from the CPOA. Uh, Director Harness, please. Good evening, uh, Chair Dr. Cass, Honorable Board. I'm going to keep it uh, pretty short because we still have a very aggressive agenda this evening. Um, the next uh, set of budget hearings is set for March 24th at 3 p.m. Uh, I will forward to you a copy of the budget hearing package that I'm going into that hearing with. I'll get that to you uh, probably Monday. Uh, on Friday, um, I had a discussion with Associate Monitor Gia Quinto for the final submissions uh, for IMR 13. Uh, he, he commented that he did watch the discussion regarding the NACOL submission and Member Olivas' concerns. Uh, and he said that he and Dr. Ginger will be open to discussing that at the next site visit. Um, <clears throat> we have 11 candidates that have uh, been identified to move on to the interview process after the written, uh, after the writing exercise and I'll be scheduling those interviews. I'll be scheduling them tomorrow to take place uh, Tuesday and Thursday of next week. Um, APD's uh, IMR 13 compliance report has been submitted and you should have received a copy of that. If not, let me know when I will get that to you. Uh, there's one more session for OMA training um, through the city. Uh, that's on March 24th. Member Army Hill Pruitt attended on uh, yesterday, yesterday afternoon. Um, and then to follow up on Lieutenant Meisinger's um, answer regarding the audits from uh, uh, Kara Garcia's uh, audit department. Um, those audits are available um, online now. And I forwarded you the, uh, in an email, I forwarded you the link to those audits so you can review those uh, report cards. Um, other than that, I, um, I'm available for questions. This member, Armio Pruitt. Just a quick question, Ed. Um, the, the report cards, I, I did click on that to see it, and I couldn't read them because it looked like they were images that were, in, like, instead of the documents themselves, like they were maybe screenshots of. So then when you try and, and um, open them up to zoom in to see them, it's illegible. And I don't know if that was a problem maybe just in my system or if that was a problem with the thing. Did anybody else have that experience? Uh, Chair Dr. Cass, member Armio Pruitt, I haven't looked at the links uh, that those links just came out this morning. I haven't had a chance to go look. Um, okay, then maybe I'm, will... maybe I'm thinking of something else then. I, there was something that was forwarded that were report cards and it was called something like that report card very recently. And I was like, wow, I don't know why I, you know, I, I couldn't tell what they were, what they were supposed to be because I couldn't zoom in on them. But if that was only this morning, then that was something else. And I'm sorry. Okay. Member Galloway. Just, um, I want to make a point of clarification. The OMA training was scheduled for March 24th, but it's being moved to March 31st. Um, I had an email exchange with Helen Maestas yesterday because I tried to log in to the OMA training yesterday and there was a thing, a, a technical glitch that wouldn't allow me to. And so she responded, letting me know that that would be March 31st instead of the 24th. Um, the positions that you were talking about were the investigator positions, correct? Not the admin assistant for the CPCs? Uh, Chair, Dr. Cass, member Galloway, yes, that's correct. Uh, that's for the investigator position. And uh, Kelly and Katrina are in the process of doing the uh, CPC office admin interviews uh, this week. I know they did one last night and I'm not sure how many more they have uh, scheduled, but they're in the process of doing those interviews now. Okay, and then only because Kelly mentioned um, having completed this task for the CPCs, it was probably the beginning part of last week, so it could have changed. Um, our minutes were still in draft form on the website. And so I don't know if that can be updated 
for 2020 and what we have now, but just caught my attention since he mentioned it. Yes, and thank you for the uh, clarification on the training. I've signed up for that training on the 24th, but I haven't received any notice that it's moved. Yeah, I'll forward, yeah, okay. I'll forward you the email from her so that you see it. And if you need to ask her any questions, you can. Thank send, you. Send it to me too, because I signed up for that on the 24th. I'll just send it out to the POB at email and it'll go to everybody. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions, comments? Well, Director Harness, uh, Member Levis. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to see uh, as a follow up to some conversations we had in personnel and, and maybe we can continue this, but just to get it before the full board. If we could work on actually getting your, your report in, in some brief uh, written form, I think that would help in the long run with, with some of the issues we discussed and, and we'll discuss later about the, uh, the uh, evaluation and, and coming up with dates and times and different things as far as when things happen. So um, just throwing that out there, um, that that would be very helpful. Certainly. Any other questions, comments, before we move on? Member Galloway. Sorry, it's just that might be a good idea too if um, Kelly anticipates being as busy every month as he was for the month of February, that might be helpful for the CPCs as well. Anyone else, any other comments? All right, well, we are at the end of reports. So we are at item seven, which is hearings on request for reconsiderations. We have none. So that brings us to item eight, which is review of cases. And I might mention that uh, it uh, became a little bit uh, more uh, complicated than our normal review uh, because we had, a, uh, as uh, discussed uh, back in uh, November, December, the board uh, directed the executive director to notify complainants when their case was going to be heard uh, and uh, so that they could appear at the meeting if, if they chose to uh, do so. And uh, we did get three individuals who responded that they do want to uh, be present, although I believe there's been a cancellation of that already. Um, so the notice was sent out uh, about uh, at the same time that the uh, cases were uploaded to the website. And so they, that meets the uh, seven day requirement, I think that we were going to give to the complainants in order to be heard. So in any case, the way I, what I would suggest is the way we handle the, uh, the administratively closed cases is to first deal with the cases which, in which the complainant has indicated that they're interested in appearing. And so I believe that first case would be uh, 13220 and uh, Jessica Wolf is the complainant. So I don't know if uh, she is uh, present in the waiting room or not, but I'll ask uh, Director Harness to fill us in. Uh, Chair, Chair, Dr. Cass, no, uh, Ms. Wolf has not, uh, has not made an appearance this evening. Um, the complainant for 24220 was in the waiting room, but uh, is no longer in the waiting room. Uh, so if I might be so uh, bold as to, to discuss all three cases at once. And then uh, the complainant for 014-21 uh, sent an email. She was unable to attend and I can read the email uh, before you decide on that particular case. All right, so we, so essentially we have no one who is present to present anything, so we can just proceed normally with, uh, with the cases. And uh, the, uh, given that the, um, there's these, uh, attempts to uh, to deal with them. Maybe we should deal with these administratively closed cases one by one. So Member, Member Mitchell, you have a comment? A uh, point of clarification. Um, I thought the reason to notice them was so that they could listen to the discussion around that particular case, but not necessarily participate in it. They have the right to appeal. There is a formal appeal process. So I guess I wouldn't want to get in a situation where we're 
relitigating the whole thing uh, over again. So I, I, maybe that's a misunderstanding on my part, but that was the way I understood it. Well, Director Hans, maybe you can clarify this. I mean, I thought that there was, we were going to give them some amount of time to speak, uh, to speak to their case, but uh, in, in terms of making an appearance at the board. So anyway, maybe, would you please clarify what, you know, what the situation is as you understand it? Uh, yes, Chair Dr. Cass, uh, in accordance with your policies and procedures, um, anyone who has a, uh, a case that is being reviewed by the board at any particular meeting and as an agenda item, um, that person or their representative uh, would be allowed a minimum of five minutes to address the board, and that's in accordance with your policies and procedures. Okay, thank you. My misunderstanding. So, uh, Council Gooch, would the, the, you had your hand up earlier, and I. Uh, so, uh, do you have a comment? Uh, Chair Dr. Cass, Honorable Board, no. Ed, uh, Director Hearn has already presented the information. Thank you. All right, thank you. So we're back to. Um, we have an attempt to. We had an attempt to be heard, but uh, no one has really uh, persevered to show up uh, at this meeting. So. Let's go revert to the agenda, but I believe we should, uh, the simple, I mean, possibly still be able to do this fairly quickly is to go through the administratively closed cases one by one and uh, ask for board uh, approval. So, uh, so I would, uh, add, Member Galloway. Do we need to go through one by one or can I make a motion to accept the administratively closed findings as presented on the agenda? Um, Director Harness. Yes, Chair Dr. Cass, I believe that 014-21 uh, is an administratively closed case. And we do have the email from the complainant in this case who wanted to appear but was unable to this evening. So does the board want to hear that prior to making a, a decision? So Let's say we, I think your motion is in order. So is there, is there a second? And then we can uh, deal with the- uh, Second. All right. So um, now would, in order to uh, hear the, I, I believe it's still possible to just go ahead and read that, that case information and then we can, we can act on the motion. So if you, if you would, in the interest of discussion, if you would present, you know, what the, uh, complainant read or read, wrote, I'm sorry. Certainly, Chair Dr. Cass, um, this is the uh, submission from the complainant, Ms. Uh, Hunnigan in 014-21. I would like to attend the meeting, but I am currently under investigation in Iowa and have had issues with harassment and someone either throwing something or slamming something when they do not get their way. Because of everything that has gone on and all I wanted was medical care in Albuquerque, New Mexico, I was misdiagnosed and mistreated in the Presbyterian Hospital 2020. I would like to go to the appointments and I had rides canceled. I would be insulted constantly by law enforcement who drove from Iowa and stayed near my apartment in Albuquerque near New Mexico. Uh, and then she gives an address uh, I had police from New Mexico and sheriff staff from Bernalillo County meet with law enforcement from Iowa by my apartment daily and insult me or try to stop me from going to doctor's appointments, which I had refunded by Lyft services. I would have packages stopped with medical items and food and other supplies. I have been to state where they insult you daily and tell me dumb, tell me I'm dumb for buying things like medical insurance. And then when I try to complain to relatives, jam my phone so it wouldn't work when I wanted to receive calls or call my phone repeating or text me from 563 area code numbers or VOIP callers. I have tried to file complaints with Diane McDermott and with senators in Albuquerque, New Mexico and with civil rights councils and with the White House. If I try to do something, I'm lying according to all law enforcement then it would be in to sick 
to doing something. I had people around and insult me and tell me how much they hate me. I had to call more than one lawyer to see if I had anything. They checked, I have no warrants and no previous record. I called to see if I was wanted, nothing. I had a lawyer from Albuquerque, New Mexico tell me to go home. If I want medical help, do not get care in Albuquerque. I was called a racial slur and a person tell me from the apartment that I need to stop the racism. I have also here don't care all the time, who cares and et cetera. I called the police and talked to them in August, 2020. The police who came to my apartment, listened to me talk about my laptop and several allegations I heard. They nodded, asked if I was all right and left. That was before I went to the hospital. I tried to get follow-up care with Susan Alden and would have rides canceled and comments made about how much they hate me and can't stand me. Before I left Albuquerque, New Mexico, I had people in law enforcement running around repeating that I would, I said and laughing. I would see sheriff's vehicles and watch sheriff staff go in and out of the apartment complex I lived in. I would see police from Bernalino County police park on the side of my apartment by the dumpster and the tree where the camera is on 544 Charleston, Albuquerque, New Mexico. I will try to attend by Zoom, but because, because there is way more to say, like having issues with people watching me in the bathroom and making inappropriate comments, and inviting people to watch me shower. I had to turn off lights in the bathroom because of the comments about my body. Because of everything currently going on, I will eventually hire a private investigator and look into polygraph, but I have people every day in my area watching me and doing things. I have to look into mental health and I will find a therapist. If you have any questions, let me know. I have pictures of vehicles. I have 500 63 numbers from when law enforcement were in Albuquerque, New Mexico with me in August 2020 to October 2020. I did call teledoc services in August and September 2020 for temporary medical help until I could see a doctor in person. I currently go to the University of Iowa for all my medical care. That is her. Is there any more discussion about these administratively closed cases? Uh, so the list of administratively closed cases uh, uh, for acceptance as presented by uh, in the letters are 114 120-132-20, 134-20, 170-20, 285-20, 014-21, 025-21. So are there any, if there's, you have a motion and a second to accept these cases, is there any further discussion by the board? Yeah, I had a question about 025-21. And I'll just direct this to, to uh, Go ahead. Director Harness. Um, Director Harness, uh, this individual had filed a complaint. And then when I actually looked at the file, I noticed that there wasn't a final letter in the file um, and I could have missed it or something like that. But was this individual contacted uh, to, to basically be informed that they could either, uh, you know, appeal the complaint if it's administratively closed or that there was a final letter sent to them? Because I didn't, I didn't see, I saw a draft letter, but I didn't see a final letter. Uh, well, Chair, Dr. Cass, Member Nixon, the final letter doesn't go out until the board uh, rules on it. So that's why there's no final letter. Okay. Uh, but the draft letter should have contained uh, essentially that information regarding reopening and, uh, and administratively closing. Okay. And she provided a phone number. I, I'm assuming that Diane, uh, the investigator, attempted to, to contact this individual? Well, uh, Chair, Dr. Cass, Member Nixon, um, you're asking me to comment on a case that I would have to go back in and look at the investigative file. That's why, that's why we request questions about cases be submitted by Tuesday so that I can prepare to answer these questions for you. Okay. Any other comments before we vote? Any further discussion? All right, uh, all in favor of accepting this suite of uh, administratively closed cases, we'll do, do a roll call vote. Member Armia Pruitt. Yes. Member Galloway. Yes. Member Mitchell. Yes. 
Member Nixon. No. <clears throat> Member Olivas. Yes. And the chair votes yes. So, uh, so did you vote no, Member Nixon? I was. Yeah, I did. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to be clear. So uh, the motion passed. Uh, I'm member uh, member Armijo Pruitt. Just real quickly for uh, member Nixon's um, to, to his question, there is a um, investigators report that's included in in these different files, and that one um, specifically said that person was not contacted because the there was clear lapel video that it was you know made made the situation clear to the investigator. So just to address your question on that, I just gave it a quick look. Yeah, I, I was aware of that. That's why I voted no. I, there was some other speculation I had on that, but so the motion has to accept these administratively closed cases has passed five one. So we are now at item uh, B, unfounded and exonerated uh, cases. Uh, we have. Um, Two cases in this category, 214-20 uh, and 248-20. So do we have a motion to accept these uh, unfounded and exonerated cases as presented? So moved. Second. All right, discussion? Uh, seeing no discussion, we call the roll for approval of uh, or accepting the cases uh, 214-20 and 248-20 as presented. So uh, in favor, member Armia Pruitt. Yes. Member Galloway. Yes. Member Mitchell. Yes. Member Nixon. Yes. Member Olivas. No. And the chair votes yes. So the unfounded and exonerated cases were are accepted uh, on a vote of five to one. So we are at the last, at item C now, not sustained, which is case 242-20, and uh, which, which the complainant was attempted to make an appearance, but is not no longer um, in the waiting room, I believe. So uh, is there a motion to accept 242-20? So moved. Second. All right, so discussion? Case 242-20. Seeing no, are you just, okay. Right. Had an itch. All right. Um, all right, well, if, if that's all it is, then we will, uh, I'll call for, uh, it looks like there's no discussion. So I call the roll to uh, accept case 242-20. So in favor of accepting, member Armijo Pruitt. Yes. Member Galloway. Yes. Member Mitchell. Yes. Member Nixon. Yes. Member Olivas. Yes. And the chair votes yes. So the the uh, case is accepted uh, by, by a unanimous vote, six nothing. So we are now at item nine, which is serious use of force cases, officer involved shooting. Uh, we have none in, in, uh, in this go around and I think you know, we'll, we'll have some more discussion about where we stand with regard to uh, uh, video uh, to getting more information and I believe Director Harness, Harness has a comment about this. So go ahead. Yes, thank you Chair Dr. Cass. Uh, I did receive a link today for the case uh, from a couple of months ago that the board wanted the investigative file. So I re did receive that link today. So I'll get that out to you tomorrow. And there's also another link to um, um, other cases, which I will get to you uh, tomorrow as well. So uh, you'll be getting um, the initial case information um, from one link. That's for you to review in your uh, protocols for the force review board findings. And then there's a second link that you're going to get for an entire investigative case file that the board has voted that it wanted to review. So both of those will be coming to you tomorrow. So there's no confusion. Thank you. Um, I might mention also that uh, I believe the board received, all the board received a copy of uh, an analysis from uh, former member uh, Jim Larson uh, regarding one of our 
early cases that we decided, and I just like to acknowledge his uh, his thoughtful analysis of this case. So um, we, you know, we we're not going to revisit it, but it, but um, he did, and he added some you know, interesting information. I thought it had an interesting perspective. So. <clears throat> Um, moving on, we're now at item 10, which is reports from subcommittees, and I, but we're also at about the time to take a break. So if uh, that seems, so I would uh, uh, have us take a break and reconvene at 7.15.
All right, we're back in session. This is uh, uh, from a break. Uh, this is a, the March 11th meeting of the Board of the Civilian Police Oversight Agency. And uh, we would we are down to item um, 10 on the agenda, but I've been informed that uh, uh, the one of the complainants who had uh, asked to uh, speak at this meeting has now reappeared in the uh, in the waiting area. And so if we can move back to this uh, <clears throat> to item eight, which was a review of cases. This is the, I believe this is uh, case 242-20. So uh, uh, having voted on this case, uh, any board member who's voted in the affirmative could vote to reconsider whether we would have this, uh, allow this person to uh, present their, uh, their five minutes of, of uh, review of their case. So uh, is that, uh, I would need a motion from a member of the board to reconsider this. Is there a motion from the board to do this? You need a motion to reconsider in order to allow this person to speak. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll move to reconsider. A second. All right. And, so, and what, was the, what was the case number again? It was the it's case uh, 24220. Is that correct? Yeah. Director Harness? Yes. All right. Um, so any discussion? Uh, all in favor, uh, Member Armia Pruitt, uh, reconsidering and having this person speak. Yes. Uh, Member Galloway. Yes. Member Mitchell. Yes, as long as it's five minutes. Yes, we'll, we'll make that clear. Member uh, Nixon. Yes. Member Olivas. Yes. And the vote, chair votes, yes. And I, so we'll invite uh, Ms. Flores, I believe, to uh, appear uh, before the board. And we'll just remind her that there was a mistake, I believe, or at least a, 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 mis a, a typo in the uh, uh, invitation to, uh, be, uh, to address the board on their case. And it was said that they would have a minimum of five minutes. Uh, we'll make it a maximum of uh, five minutes and 10 seconds. And so that'll that would take care of it. So, but, um, so essentially we're offering the complainant five minutes to uh, present their case. So we're, we're ready for that person, please. Chair Cass, uh, member, uh, Ms. Flores is uh, in the room. Go ahead, Ms. Flores. So I, I, I don't see a audio connection of. Oops. I just tried to chat. Uh, it doesn't appear that she's muted. Uh, she's, uh, connecting yeah. to audio. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Now, if she unmutes, we'll be, should be able to proceed. So you need to unmute, Ms. Flores. Are you there? We're, Okay, there's a... Yeah. Yes, I'm here. All right, so go ahead. You have five minutes to present your uh, your case. No, hold on one second. I'm at work. I got to get my co-worker to take over real fast. Mm. I'll take. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Go ahead, please. Okay, all I just want to say that that evening, instead of helping me, like I asked, you know, they called my neighbor called for help, and he did not do that. I mean, he didn't even do the basic civil right of using the restroom. He got the information all wrong, and he was just basically trying to get me in trouble. And he did not file a report. He said to the hospital that I bumped my head. 
Yes, he is. Yes, he is. He's outside. Go around. Go around the building. Yeah. And then I made several attempts, years and years, trying to call the police station, trying to get a hold of him, trying to get him to go get the, the footage from the 7-Eleven. He wouldn't do any of that. There was just no response at all. All I was getting yelled at was by his sergeant, like, basically telling me, oh, you can't sue. That's it. That's all I have to say for right now. All right. Um, are, are there any questions? Are there no. any questions from the board? I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I know that the detective interviewed the neighbors. So are are you finished with your presentation? Well, I mean, I wrote, yeah. I mean, you, he had everything in the report. I mean, I don't know what you guys want me to say at this point. Well, we, we would just like you to, we're giving you the opportunity to explain your your case and uh, you still have, you know, about three minutes left to do that. And we just want to make sure that you had ample, you'd said what you wanted to say and uh, we can ask. Uh, yeah, he cut, he put me in cuffs and he shouldn't have put me in cuffs. The, the call that was in to the 911 is that I was getting assaulted in front of my home. Then he goes because I was drinking with my family members. Okay, they all went home, went to 7-Eleven to go get drinks and food. Like everybody else does in Albuquerque to get those burritos. And when I got up there, I got assaulted at the 7-Eleven and then they, they took it all the way to the front of my door. And instead of him helping me, he turned around and he turned it on me. He put cuffs on me right away. He had me on my knees. He wouldn't let me use the restroom. And I just barely, I barely that one of my aunts was there and got a hold of my uh, my cousin and she came down and then because she's a nurse at Presbyterian and she told me to nod my head if I got assaulted because I couldn't speak. And I said, yeah, I nodded my head, but he didn't ask me anything. He was just like, just wanted to throw me under the bus pretty much. And his report on the hospital, I mean, it just looks bad. It just says that I overdrink and that I bumped my head. And that night when I went into the hospital, the next morning when I got out of the hospital, they, um, overnight, the people that assaulted me ended up breaking into my apartment, taking all my kids' um, devices, TVs and whatnot and other stuff. That's all in the report that the lady did the next morning. Is that all? Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Um, are there is there any comment questions from the board? Then I would uh, thank you for your presentation, and the board can now uh, reconsider your your administratively closed case. So uh, I see no further discussion questions from the board, and I'll call for a roll call vote to. Uh, accept the findings of this administratively closed case. I'm sorry, this is uh, of this not sustained case. This is case 242-20. Okay. So I think and this case is to vote what, is, is it there going to be a suspension, uh, fired, or I mean, what, what's going to take place? The, the vote is to accept the letter that was written, uh, the findings of, of the agency uh, that investigated your case and is, and is sending a letter uh, with the results of their investigation. Okay, and then from there further, I can give it to my attorney, right? Uh, you, you can, yes, it's it's okay. it's up to you to do, yeah. you know, take further action then. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys' time. All right, and thank All you right, for have a good night. Thank All you. Right. So um, I'd like to call the roll for uh, voting on the accepting this um, case as presented. 242-20, so in favor of accepting. Member Galloway had her hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. We're, I was I was just going to correct the admin closed thing, but he beat me to it. Okay, so we're we're all good? Yep. Okay, Member Armia Pruitt. Yes. Member Galloway. Yes. Member Mitchell. Yes. Member Nixon. Yes. Member Olivas. Yes. The chair votes yes. So... This case has been accepted as not sustained. 
and um, the letter will be sent to Ms. Flores so she can take action as she sees fit after this. So we're back on the regular part of the agenda. We're now back at reports from subcommittees, item 10. So <clears throat> um, the community outreach subcommittee, member Galloway. So I don't really have anything more to add to what was presented in the outreach report. Um, there are a couple of things that have bubbled up from the committee for the board's consideration that will be addressed later on in the agenda. But unless there's any questions, our next meeting is scheduled for March 23rd at 3 p.m. via Zoom. Thank you. Are there any questions from Member Galloway regarding this report? All right, seeing none, we'll move to the policy and procedure review subcommittee report. And I would give you, I'll give that. And so our last meeting was a week ago on March 4th. And I think to highlight the only, I listed the, the um, policies which have been heard at, recently at OPA and PPRB. And a highlight uh, which coincides with a webinar that um, <clears throat> was presented by NACOL regarding surveillance technologies on February 23rd. Uh, the uh, presenter at that point uh, listed the, you know, the common surveillance technologies employed by various police departments in the US. Turns out that a couple of those are uh, being uh, considered or being considered at OPA or PPRB at this, at this time. And so it was appropriate that um, the uh, that this information was available uh, that you know shows how you know essentially the uh, ask the kind of questions that should be asked about the technologies, and um, uh, I included those in the report, so I won't go review them here. But I think there's a good connection between uh, what NACOL is uh, is providing information for and what's going on at the, uh, at the policy level at, a at APD as well. So these are the important issues I think that you know, we can identify to follow. So our next meeting is April 1st uh, and I'll stand for any questions. So seeing no questions, I'll move on to case review, member Nixon, the case review committee. Yeah. Thank you. So the uh, audit report for the fourth quarter of 2020 was delivered and um, it was also sent out to the board um, a little bit late, but everybody got it. Um, I didn't have anything out of the ordinary to, to um, report on this, uh, this audit, but uh, if anybody had any questions, I would answer those. Okay. So yes, we also have, this will also be on the agenda uh, to re, you know, for the review and approval of the fourth quarter report, which is a further item down the list. So for discussion, so, yeah. so no other uh, member Mitchell. I'm sorry, I, I'd just like to go back just for a minute, just make a statement. I think that presentation by the canine unit would be a good thing for the entire board to hear. I've. I never realized that they released those dogs muzzled sometimes. So I think there was information there that might um, add a perspective that we don't all have. Just FYI. We, we can certainly ask them to come to the, uh, to appear to, before the board and give a report. So, um, all right, so we're back. Uh, so were there any questions for member Nixon regarding um, case review committee? Chair Dr. Kess, I do. Um, on case review, it also states that there's a selection of first quarter audit cases. Member Nixon, uh, do you have the, do you have that information? On the selection of the ones that were sent March 1st? which is the ones we went over or no, I don't have a selection of them just yet. Um, unless they are the ones that are after uh, March 1st, which I don't have, I have not. 
I don't have a batch of them to select. And I know that we do the random number generator to do that selection, but I do not have that information. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, all right, so moving on to uh, personnel committee report, member Olivas. Well, just before we do that, can I ask a question of Valerie? Um, those, those reports that we do the random, <clears throat> we pick them randomly from, have those been sent out? The next batch of reports, or excuse me, of um, complaints? Um, I'm sorry, Member Nixon, maybe uh, Chantel Galloway could chime in on that. I'm not exactly sure what the process is internally. Yeah, I'm happy to, Valerie. So what we would do, Eric, is from the January, February, and March um, complaints that we have reviewed, we would upload those to the randomizer tool and select a minimum of three, but 10% of cases that the board has already heard to audit. So the, any of the cases, like the ones that we approved this evening on the agenda, you just take a look at the cases on the agenda, upload those in the randomizer tool and select 10% or a minimum of three. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And Chair Dr. Cass, is that something that we could do um, and come back to this agenda item so it could be announced at this meeting so we could stay on track? Um, I'm not, I don't know that this is gonna be, can this be done in real time? Is that what you're asking? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. It can, it's very quick. And I'm happy to, to do that if you guys would like, or Eric, if you wanna do it, um, just so long as we get it taken care of. Um, looking over the cases I've looked over, um, I would rather just pick three cases. I have them available to pick them now, unless you know we're hard set on, on doing it randomly. It's okay. under policy that we do it randomly. It has to be done that way. Okay. So, so we'll delay. We'll delay this. And uh, who's who's going to uh, run the randomizer? That would be me. Okay. All right. So, we'll. So, if you'll do that, you know, we'll come back to this item uh, later in the agenda and, and make that announcement. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So now we're at the personnel committee report. Member Levis. Thank you, Chair Dr. Kess. Um, like the other uh, reports, I think everything that uh, really needs to be stated is either listed in the report or will be discussed later in other agenda items that relate to this. But we did have two meeting dates, uh, February 8th and February 22nd. And our next meeting is going to be on March 22nd at 4 p.m. Staff for questions. Any questions? Seeing no questions, uh, we are at um, discussion and at item 11, discussion possible action items. So the now we're at the uh, review and approval of the fourth quarter case findings audit report. Uh, Member Nixon, is that, this is what you've, uh, I, I believe what's what you submitted and what you were referring to earlier. So if you would like to uh, introduce this subject, then the board can uh, vote on accepting this uh, fourth quarter audit report. Okay, and again, are there any questions on the fourth quarter <coughs> audit report? Um, I didn't see anything out of the ordinary, anything that was in question similar to what uh, Member Mitchell had, had brought up about the uh, canines. Uh, we didn't go through that with the random uh, generated uh, cases. So I'm open for any questions at this point on the audit process or the audit uh, report. And if there aren't any, I turn it back to you. Okay, so, uh, sure, so sure. is there a motion to accept the fourth, um, yes, the, the fourth quarter audit report? So moved. Second? Second. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, uh, we'll have a roll call vote. Member Armia Pruitt? Yes. Yes, uh, Member Galloway? No. Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Levis? 
Yes. And the chair votes yes. So the fourth quarter audit report is accepted 5-1 by a vote of 5-1. to one. Okay, we are at item B, approval of the January to June 2020 semi-annual report. So I would entertain a motion. I'd make a motion to uh, adopt the report as drafted and submitted by the uh, agency. Second. Discussion? I'd just like to thank Ali for um, the things that I brought to his attention. He corrected them right away and got them back to me. So I, that was very appreciated. Director Harness, did you have a comment? Uh, yes, Chair Dr. Cass. Uh, actually, yes, I wanted to thank both Ali and Member Mitchell for their contributions to the draft and um, that that draft was uh, updated in the SharePoint for the board's review and that's the draft that you're going to be approving this evening, hopefully. Any other comments before we vote on approving this or accepting this report? Uh, seeing no other comments, I would call the roll for approving the June, January to June 2020 semi-annual report. Member Amiel Pruitt. Yes. Member Galloway. Yes. Member Mitchell. Yes. Member Nixon. Yes. Member Levis. Yes. And the chair votes yes. So the uh, 2020, January to June 2020 semi-annual report is approved unanimously. All right, we are moving on to <clears throat> item C, uh, update on CPOA board member reviews. And uh, so I, uh, I would just uh, mention that this was a, the, the process of having a board self-assessment is what we voted on several months ago as part of our conduct and ethics policy. It was a culmination of uh, individual board member reviews followed by this board self-assessment, which was held last Thursday. So um, I think it, you know, for a first time through this process, I think it went reasonably well. Uh, and uh, you know, all I, all I can say is that uh, we're, it, for, the, for now it's finished and we'll start all over again in a, you know, for next year. But, I welcome any comments that members might have regarding this uh, the, this process. So, if there, member Lewis, yeah, yes. Uh, I just want to say appreciate your your work uh, organizing all of those, and I, I thought those were productive individual sessions, and and as well as the the group session. And uh, just thank you for your time on that, and uh, and to all the members that participated. I thought it was a, a useful exercise. Thank you. Um, any other comments? Um, all right, so we, if seeing no other comments, we'll move on to item D, which is the uh, update on developing a process to access level three force cases. And I, uh, we got the city's view. Of, this is a, you know, a meeting that was uh, set up to get city legal and our attorney, uh, uh, Ms. Gooch, to as well as the executive director. And I sat in on this meeting as well. Uh, so I would turn this over to attorney Gooch and director Harness to make their comments about the progress we're making on getting serious use of force case information. So Ms. Gooch. Thank you, Chair Dr. Cass and honorable board. Um, yeah, so Ms. Van Meter has already presented generally the structure of what we're trying to do and that is coordinate with the APOA um, in line with the CBA as well as the CASA ordinance and your policies and procedures. We are in our preliminary stages, so I don't have any kind of written work product to present to the board for consideration. But generally the issues that the board's well aware of is the time it takes to redact the officer information in the OBRD footage that you all finally are getting some. Um, because it took a long time from the city's perspective to get those redactions done. So we are trying to figure out a way to streamline this process in a way that gets everyone the information that they need in a manner that is as expeditious as possible. So I don't have a 
you know, a, again, a memorandum of understanding to present to the board tonight, but we are working on it. And I'm hopeful that by next month's meeting, we should have a little better framework for the board's consideration. Director Harness, would you like to add anything? Uh, Chair, Dr. Cass, no, I think uh, Attorney Gooch, your counsel has covered all of, uh, all of the issues. Um, you know, that this just boils down to uh, essentially ensuring that uh, your review uh, meets the tenets of the collective bargaining agreement at this point. And so uh, the city is looking for some leeway in uh, making it efficient for uh, video redactions uh, for your review. I might also mention that there was some discussion about making this sufficient for uh, not only from the city's standpoint of redaction, but from this, the uh, uh, board standpoint of getting the information that we need, but not getting overwhelmed with uh, sort of irrelevant information where there's hours and hours of video that uh, that we'd have to wade through before we get to the important video or the, the pertinent video. And so that's being discussed as well. And uh, that, you know, that's part of the process, I think, that will make it easier for us to, you know, get the information we do need. So any other, any other comments by the board? Yes, Member Romeo Pruitt. So do you guys remember when we went through the like force review board training and they talked about how the process with the videos all being marked at a certain time when important things were happening so that that avoids what you're just talking about with like wading through hours of, you know, laying the, the caution tape or whatever. Um, so isn't that already a part of their process? Uh, Chair, Dr. Cass, I can answer that question. Yes, um, there are markings within the, uh, I'm sorry, Chair Dr. Cass, member Armio Pruitt. Yes, there are markings within the videos um, as um, for the review. Uh, the contemplation is, however, to put together a list which every force review board attendee gets, which is a list called pertinent videos. Uh, for the investigation, uh, as opposed to all of the video for a particular investigation. So this is a, a larger step beyond uh, marking and individual videos. This is a, a guide for you so that you're not watching 15 videos, you could watch five videos. And then within those videos, there would be those event markings that you referenced. Any other, any other, does that answer your question? Remember me up, Rudd? Any other comments? So, uh, so I, that's where, that's where the process stands. So if there's, uh, and it's, it's a work in progress and it, it, it certainly is a, you know, it's going to take time because there's a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, moving parts here, I think, some of which we have no control over. So, um, so we are at um, item E, which is the update on the stipulated order establishing the EFIT or the Inter external force investigation team. So uh, I would uh, turn this back to uh, Director Harness and, uh, and Council Gooch. So if Council Gooch, if you'd like to comment. Uh, Chair Dr. Cass, Honorable Board, I believe Director Harness is unmuted and was prepared to address this. I have nothing in addition to add other than what Ms. Van Meter already presented to the board tonight. Uh, Chair Dr. Cass, uh, Honorable Board, uh, yes, the EFIT uh, motion was approved or the order was approved and signed by the court on the 26th. Um, However, the judge did reserve the right to issue an opinion uh, to address objections and concerns from the APOA. And then Ms. Van Meter this evening put in the link to the RFP for that EFT, uh, that EFIT administrator position. 
uh, for your review. And that, that would be all I have to say at this point. Any questions? Uh, Member Mitchell. Director Harness, <clears throat> maybe you don't know this, but what kind of budget allocation has the city made for this? Um, Chair Dr. Cast, Member Mitchell, I don't know the budget allocation um, or EFIT. Um, the discussions in the in the hearing on the 26th were that this was going to be a six to nine month project once all the once all the personnel were in place. Um, I'm not sure how much of a wrinkle now with Superintendent Stanley coming on board uh, adds to that timeline, but I'm not aware of any of the budget numbers. Uh, I'm sorry, and I will say that I find it um, interesting that on a projected caseload of 600 cases, they believe they need 25 investigators for that caseload. That's the projection as, pre as presented to uh, the court. Um, you know, being selfish, uh, if, you know, with 600 intake for us, uh, I would say, you know, maybe if we just got 15 investigators, we, we probably would be happy with that. But um, the projection to the court for the force investigations was a projected caseload of 600 and staffing of 25 investigators to handle that caseload. Will those all be contractors or will they be, be temporary city employees? Uh, Chair Dr. Cass, Member Mitchell, I haven't reviewed the RFP uh, as yet to designate that. I know that there's contemplation that um, uh, along with the needing for staffing of, of, of continued force investigators, that there's contemplation that uh, internal affairs will have to hire uh, civilian investigators to staff those positions. Thank you. Any other any other comments, questions about um, EFIT? Oh, Member Olivas. Thank you, Chair Cass. Um, I guess I wanted to I wanted to raise my concerns about the board's lack of of uh, position on this issue. I think that um, you know at this point that's that's neither here nor there. Um, but we were provided very limited time to actually um, analyze this proposal that was going before the court. And uh, really, there was no way to actually take a position on this as a board before this uh, went before the court. Um, I think this issue underscores several problems that, that affect us throughout our uh, job here. One being that we are not a party to the um, agreement, so we're not able to, uh, to be involved in these discussions at an earlier period. And um, two, that it, it often seems to be the case that these issues are presented to us as an afterthought by the city and, and the parties that be. Um, I think this isn't the first time that this has happened, and it's unfortunate because I think that there's a number of concerns that have been raised by uh, agency staff, I'm, I'm sure Director Harness probably represented some of those uh, quite well, but nevertheless, the board wasn't able to formally take its position representing um, citizens of, of Albuquerque as the board does. So I, I think it's concerning that we weren't able to take a position on this and that really this was an afterthought. Um, putting putting this on the board or, or asking the board to, to issue a, an opinion or a, a statement on this. Um, I think to me, the most concerning part of this is the fact that outsourcing these investigations further diminishes the importance of investigations within APD. Um, if, if the root of the problem here is that they're not completing investigations in a, in a thorough manner, and the solution is to outsource this at presumably great expense to the taxpayers, but I think even greater expense to the investigative abilities of the department. Uh, whether that's civilian or uniformed. So um, it's probably neither here nor there at this point, but I think this deserves uh, a little bit of our time and a little bit of our thought to 
uh, think about what this is doing to the abilities of the department to not only police itself, but you know, one has to imagine these investigators, um, they transfer in and out of these positions. And so, you know, an investigator that may be working in IA may later transfer to homicide or to robbery or to crimes against children. And they're gonna be using those investigative skills to advance those important crime fighting causes and vice versa. You're gonna have investigators transferring out of those units and into IA um, as, as time goes on. And so I think that this um, really only compounds a problem that we've raised repeatedly. We've repeatedly heard that we're gonna see a detective track, we're gonna see improvements. And that seems to be all we've heard over the years is that, that this is going to happen, but we've never had any concrete evidence that there is actually an investment of time, resources and uh, effort on the department's part to actually make these reforms and, and make investigations a priority, whether those are internal or external. And to that point, Eric, because you bring up a good point, um, when, when thinking about outsourcing the investigations, is there any uh, gain as far as um, autonomy in the process of the investigation so that it's, it doesn't look like the, the fox guard the hen house, it looks more like a, an independent investigation can be done? Um, what are your thoughts on that? If it's outsourced is what I'm saying. Uh, sorry, I, I don't know if that was a, a question for me, but I think yeah. that's a good point. A, a good, you know, flip side of this is is that that is a you know a, a check, right? To have these outside investigators, and and APD will still have its its IA investigators, as as I understand it. So it's it's doubling up, um, but at the same time, I think that that further undermines our position uh, as and and our agency's position as a as the so-called outside investigator, the civilian investigator. So, you know, I think it's a good point. It, it definitely could, could lead to that, that check, um, but at the same time, it, it may deplete other, uh, other resources that need to be built up. So, so if that outsourced unit was to be leveraged under the board where, for lack of a better term, board controlled for the investigation process, what do you what do you think of, of that as well? Let me interrupt here, but I think um, I'm I'm not quite sure where the where this discussion is going. But I think we what we're talking about is something that has you know is not ever going to be within control of the board uh, of, of this board. I mean, I think we're. There were a series of, of meetings which were held that, that allowed for public input and invited public input in briefing this uh, this process. And at at this point, I think the the most relevant you know discussion that we're going to have is the one we're having right now. I mean, I think or most effective because I think the process is going to go on, uh, and it's a process that's created by APD with you know with public input, but still it's it's their process and it, and uh, you know the you know this the monitor and the and the city and the and APD are primarily responsible for it. I think we can weigh our concerns and this may be the best forum for doing that. Uh, I'm not sure we're we're going to ever have a, a more uh, definitive uh, chance to actually express what you know what we you know, are concerned about other than in this kind of a meeting right here and we can have it on a as a subject for discussion is, you know, in both in subcommittee meetings and in this meeting here. But this, the intent here was to update the process. And I think, you know, so I'm, I'm just, you know, would like to, you know, find out if there's any further uh, comments by board members and we'll close this item and move on. So you're saying outside of this discussion here, all of the um, avenues for expanding this to, to what Eric's point is, have more input into it are exhausted at this point. Uh, yeah, yes, I mean essentially they're they're proceeding with developing this plan. They're going to let the contract. They're going to hire you know who, whoever they hire, whatever that number turns out. I mean, but all those negotiations were uh, you know at a, held at a higher level. We we were invited to be you know to have a, a public input and make that and make our comments at those kinds of meetings. Uh, you know, but we're, you know, we don't have final say or, you know, 
you know, after that point, there was there's no further input. Remember Galloway? I understand that, but when you say public input, I'm assuming as a citizen, not as a board member, but as a citizen to, to give. Well, as a, yes, as a stakeholder or, yes, a member of the public, right. Um, yes, Member Galloway. So I don't think that we're necessarily out of options, but I think at this point, the option is to monitor how this process unfolds and provide feedback on that if we have any that the court ruled on this, so. Councilor Gooch, did I? Yeah. Thank you, Chair, Dr. Cass, Honorable Board. Um, I, I really appreciate the discussion and we'll inform the board because um, I don't think any of you were on it. The other stakeholders have been monitoring and doing and looking at all the things that Member Olivas has mentioned. And it might make sense for the board to consider as the process moves forward, inviting them or others, even from the EFIT team to come to the board to help educate not only the board, but the public about how the process is going. Because as everyone here knows, it's new. The court acknowledged that it's new. I believe the DOJ and um, the city in their presentations to the court also said, you know, this is a new process. So um, I agree with uh, member Dr. Cass that, you know, the, the order says what it says, but there is the ability to help the process or at least weigh in on the process as it proceeds if the board is so inclined moving forward. Uh, thank you. So any other any other comments? All right, seeing no further comments, we will move on to where am I? Um, I believe we're at item F, legal counsel contract. And uh, this is a uh, pretty much a, a reminder that um, in a month or in, actually I believe it's about June, the our legal counsel contract will be up for renewal. Or, and so what we're trying to do is remind the board that the, um, whether we have the option of renewing or putting out an RFP for a different legal uh, counsel contract, uh, our I believe our, it's appropriate to hear whether our uh, legal counsel wants to continue this contract at some point and uh, I'll let her decide when she wants to say that, what she wants to say and when she wants to say that. If you want to say it now, then uh, that's appropriate too. So if you want to wait, uh, you can wait, so. Uh, Chair Dr. Cass, Honorable Board. Yeah, the, the timeline is such that, I, that it's on the agenda tonight for the board's consideration. And if the board votes to continue working with me, which I hope it does, I would bring you the contract um, for the next meeting for a board consideration. And the, the processes as they are do take quite some time. So with Katrina's help, we are trying to stay ahead of things so that however you all decide to vote, you have plenty of time to do that. Um, I, I will say that I enjoy working with all of you and I wish there were more of you. I hope that we get more of you. Uh, <laughs> but also if you're so inclined, um, I, would, I would really appreciate being able to continue working with you all. Member Galloway. So I would make a motion that we proceed um, in a good faith effort to retain Tina's services and that of her law firm. Second. Discussion? So, um, so your motion is to proceed in a, I'm sorry, uh, proceed in a good faith effort to uh, continue the contract, is that right? Yeah, because we're gonna have to review the contract. So until we've done that, I don't think that we can say, yes, let's do this. But I think right. that moving forward in that direction is a way to go. Okay, discussion. Member Levis, you had your hand up. Or um, I, I guess I'm just questioning whether we need to to make a motion for that, or if we can simply consider the contract at the next uh, meeting. I do have some concerns about simply, uh, you know, agreeing to proceed with renewal without having seen a contract. Um, not that I have any particularly concerns uh, about council or, or issues relating to that, but I. I just don't know if we need to uh, take this step without actually seeing something. Member Galloway. 
my um, goal in that is to unnecess to avoid unnecessary uh, solicitations of other representatives until we have a need to do so. To go on ahead and just move forward with this one and then see where the contract takes us. That's all. So basically, your your motion is that <clears throat> we ask. Tina or whoever's designated to prepare a contract for our review, right? Uh, Director Harness, you had something to add? Uh, thank you, Dr. Cass. Yes, this is um, this is a, a preemptive uh, motion to avoid the RFP process in having to solicit other legal contracts. So. Conceptually, the board wants to continue the relationship with current council. Current council wants to continue the, re the relationship. Therefore, a contract will be presented for the board to approve. That, and then that gives the agency the time to make sure that it's in place so that there's no lapse in, in representation for fiscal year 22. Any further discussion about this motion to ask for a contract to be prepared? So seeing no further discussion, I'd call the roll uh, to approve this. Member Amio Pruitt? Yes. Member Galloway? Yes. Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Olivas? Yes. And the chair votes yes. So the motion carried six nothing. All right, moving on to um, Update on the access to legal counsel. I believe this was an item initiated by Member Olivas, and so I'll, if you would like to report on this, uh, I would uh, uh, do this, or I would, you know, offer this chance. Otherwise, I can sum it up in a few words. But I'll, the floor is yours, if you like. Uh, I believe the board has received a, a memo from legal counsel on that, and uh, in order to not waive. Uh, Attorney-client privilege. I believe I'll leave it at that. So, the, so that has been resolved, and the uh, the item is closed essentially. So, uh, so I believe this also closes out the discussion about this item. Um, unless there's other comments, I see none. So. Um, we are at item H, which is the uh, 2021 OMA resolution, which I've been looking forward to reading all night long. So, I, so here we are. I believe this is. If you could, um, if you could set the stage for this, uh, Member Gooch, I'll I'll get um, I go off and uh, get, <clears throat> start gargling salt water. Um, <laughs> Chair Dr. Kess, Honorable Board, this is a requirement of the OMA uh, that the board could take a resolution every calendar year to reaffirm all of the requirements of the OMA, how the board will meet, how it will proceed with its meetings, and how it will post notices. Um, I will not read it to the board unless someone would like me to, but everyone has the opportunity to look at it. And if anyone has any questions about what is there or why it's there, I'm happy to answer those questions. Does this mean we don't have to read it? Okay, uh, good. Chair, because Chair I, thought Hiss, the, yes. I thought in the past we had uh, we had read this, and and it, but it, it is a matter of record. We do have a, everyone has a copy of it. It's it's as uh, Council Gooch described. So. Um, if there's a motion to accept these, uh, the Albuquerque Civilian Police Oversight Agency Board resolution, and it has not been assigned a number yet, but there's a num some number that can be filled in on the blank. Uh, this is the document that has been presented to the board and it deals with uh, uh, the information pertinent to the OMA. So, so moved. Yeah. All right, so uh, second? second. Uh, any discussion? Seeing no discussion, uh, call, a roll, call the roll to uh, accept the, um, or to make the resolution to accept the OMA requirements. So, uh, Member Amia Pruitt. Yes. Member Galloway. Yes. Member Mitchell. Yes. Member Nixon. 
Yes. Member Olivas. Yes. And the chair votes yes. So that uh, resolution has been approved to accept this OMA requirement and avoid the public reading. Um, update on the um, board rotation for public safety committee. Uh, I believe this is member Olivas's uh, item and I, I will turn the floor over to him. Thank you, Chair Kess. Uh, I believe board members have received uh, a copy of my proposed, um, I, I don't wanna call this amendment to the policies. I think it's just kind of a separate agreement uh, between board members among the board of, of what our responsibilities would, could, or should be. Um, again, this is a draft. And uh, I think my, my request for this would be that Certainly we could discuss it tonight and, and I, I guess take action on it if we wanted to, but uh, in, in an effort not to subvert the uh, committee process, which I think is often been um, you know, used in, in these sorts of situations, I would uh, ask that this be referred to the outreach subcommittee for further review um, and, and perhaps their own recommendations and markup. And then we could uh, review this again at a, at a subsequent meeting. So are there any discussion, Member Galloway? Happy to take that on if it's okay by the rest of the board. Any other, any other comments or discussion? So um, we can call, uh, call for an approval by the board to uh, send this to the outreach committee for uh, further work and, and to bring this product back to the board when? Uh, at the next meeting? Or at least a, a draft of the pro of of this uh, is that a, is that reasonable? In theory, yeah. Okay, it doesn't have to be perfect at that point. So, it's, it's, all right. So uh, I'd call the roll to uh, approve the approve the sending of this uh, process development to the outreach committee. So, all in favor, Member Armia, approve it. Yes, but we didn't have a motion in a second. Just I, I want to do that. I, I think I don't know that we needed a motion. I think I think we were just sending this as a task. Okay. Yes. Um, Member Galloway. Yes. Member uh, Mitchell. Yes. Member uh, Olivas. I'm skipping. Yes. Member Nixon. Sorry. Yes. All right. The chair votes yes. So this will be sent to the outreach committee for um, work. All right, we are at item um, J, which is the CPOA Public Relations Engagement Protocol. Uh, Member Galloway. So I'm actually going to um, just give a little bit of a background on this. This protocol is uh, drafted by Member Nixon. I don't know if everybody's had an opportunity to kind of glance it over. It's fairly short if you have not. Um, but this is in response to the selection of a, of a kind of spokesperson for the board, separate from the agency, but in tandem with the agency um, for the purposes of media inquiries and things of that nature. There's also some gentle reminders in there about our responsibilities as board members um, to kind of toe the line when the board has made a decision um, and supporting that decision publicly. So um, unless there's any questions or concerns about that, I think that the next step is to actually draft a policy around that. So this is kind of the pre-policy input stage. Any discussion, comments? Uh, I, I have a, <clears throat> I have a couple comments, and uh, and that is that I, I think that this is a good start, and I and I recognize it as a start, and that it needs further work. Uh, one of the things that I would change is the, uh, or admit is essentially is what the definition of public is. Uh, it's in this, it's considered any entity or individual who's not part of the CPOA. I think there must be some, uh, you know, a whole lot of uh, legal uh, work that's been done as to what defines public. And I don't think we wanna go back and, and reinvent that. So 
or, or refight that battle. So I would, I would just leave out what any kind of definition of public is. Uh, the second thing is I, and I, I've, you know, expressed this sentiment in the past, but um, I think we, it, that I would, um, I don't think it's necessary to make a disclaimer that we're we're speaking as a, we're speaking as a citizen when we're known to be a board member, and I think that. What I think what's most important is what the content of our speech is. If we if we speak in public, if we speak about uh, matters which may be relevant to the you know to the business of the CPOA, but it is it's something that's ongoing. It's something that's being proposed. It's just kind of a status. Then it's the content that's important. And and we're obviously board members, and we're obviously speaking as board members because we have access to that information. That does not mean that we're speaking on behalf of the board, but we can be a board member and we cannot, you know, and we can speak for ourselves as board members. And I think that's a, I think that I would, you know, you know, try not to, you know, create a disclaimer that says um, we're speaking as a member of the public uh, or, or we're speaking as a, as a, as a private person. But in fact, all I would do is I would just change the sentence that had to do with speak to the public as a member of the board, expressing their individual opinion and not the opinion of the board as a whole. And I think that would that would clarify it. But I'm sure the work, you know, I'll send you these comments if you want to, you know, if you're going to work on it. And you know, that's that, exactly that, what I was going to ask for was if right. you'd send that in writing. Right. So anyway, uh, any other comments? Yes, Member Olivas. Um, yeah, so I, I wanted to formulate my thoughts on that a little bit. I, I think I like the general uh, idea behind this policy, although I'm I'm a, I'm just a little bit. Um, I, I wonder how frequently it would be used. Um, I'm, I'm just not sure in my time on the board that that we've seen a huge um, need for it. But at the same time, I think that uh, I actually disagree with Member Dr. Cass that. Uh, that that disclaimer is is needed. I think, in fact, that that's one of the most important things that board members should understand is that uh, if they're not expressing um, a board resolution or a board opinion, something that the board actually voted on, it, it should be explicitly stated that, that this is their opinion or their interpretation of a situation. Obviously, that's my opinion, that's your opinion, but um, I, I think that that's something that uh, that I'd like to see the end product, um, you know, maybe find a way to uh, straddle that divide and find a way to uh, incorporate something that uses that to uh, to strengthen the board and, and strengthen the authority of the board so that members don't step over the line um, unintentionally or intentionally and, and uh, sort of cloud the, the waters there. So I support this. I think it's, I think it's good. And, and I love, I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to see more of it. Other comments? All right. So, you, uh, so I believe we're, so what's the resolution to this item? Um, I think that if there's any additional feedback that anybody wants to provide, go on ahead and submit that to uh, to me. Go on ahead and su submit it to me and I'll take it back to the committee. And then with any luck at all, we'll actually have a policy draft. Um, we are meeting again on the 23rd. So our timeline is in the next 12 days. <laughs> so if you guys can get me any comments um, within the next week so that we can kind of start grafting something that would be super helpful. Thanks. All right, so if there's no further discussion on this item, we'll proceed with that with that plan. If you have comments uh, that you'd like to make on this uh, proposed policy, then uh, send them to uh, Member Galloway for inclusion at a, at a uh, <clears throat> at, um, at her committee. So we are now to item K, which is use of administratively closed for complaints due to the change in officer employment status. And I believe this is your item, Member Galloway. It is, thanks Dr. Kath. So I just wanted to 
we've kind of touched on this once or twice in the past when we're doing case review and it's not really an appropriate time to to hold a fuller discussion about the use of administratively closed when the reason for that um, dispensation is simply because an officer is no longer with the force. And while I understand that that's an expedient way to handle it because there is no disciplinary action that can be taken, I think that we lose the policy review aspect when we don't actually look at anything and we just immediately um, kind of shove it over to the admin closed pile. And I think that there's a little bit of an image problem, like an optics problem that's presented as well with that, because then it looks as though the only reason for our being is to say gotcha with our department when I really think that we, my opinion, I think that we ought to be looking for ways to make the department um, or to help the department be more successful so that everybody gets home at the end of the day safely, um, feeling you know, their civil rights are completely intact, that their complaints or their issues, the reason for engaging with law enforcement is valid and validated. Um, all of those things I think are important aspects in the work that we do. And so for me, this particular topic has just always been a little troublesome. And I wanted to see if that was solely <laughs> my opinion and I'll stop bringing that up in the future or um, if this is something that we want to consider. Um, comments? Member Olivas. I, I fully support this idea and I think uh, even more so expanding that to, to other complaints and other situations. I think a lot of times we get hung up on uh, individual complaints, which are certainly important. I don't want to minimize that <clears throat> in any way. But I think that what we really need to focus on and are in fact required to focus on by our uh, ordinance mandates is policy 51% or more of our time as a board, which is nebulous how we actually measure that, um, needs to be spent on policy. And I think that one of the most important things that can be learned from these complaints um, is is less, you know, who are the good and bad officers or, or what are the mistakes that were made in this particular situation, but rather what is being trained, uh, what does the policy say, and maybe does the policy say something uh, that is in our minds wrong or something that is unclear or nebulous in some way that is leading to or has led to a particular incident or a particular outcome um, whether it's actually a violation or not, because oftentimes you're also looking at these complaints where we say um, that's within policy. And so, you know, that that's the end of the line for that complaint. And absolutely, that's, you know, you, you can't change the, the rules after the game is played. But I think at that point, you can still take a look at the policies as we have in some instances, we've taken a look at the overtime policy and uh, use of vehicle policy, things like that, and looking at areas where we've had complaints, there aren't actually uh, sustained violations, but maybe there's a policy issue. So I totally support this and, and um, anything I can do to, to be of assistance, um, I count me in. I, I think it's a, a good use of our time and, and it's where we need to move with complaints in, in my opinion is, is seeing them through a policy lens. I agree. I'm sorry. Uh... Member Nixon, you had a comment? No, I just said I agree with what Eric said. All right, Member uh, Director Harness. Um, Chair Dr. Cass, uh, how, how do you make a full policy assessment without a full investigation uh, because the agency does not have jurisdiction over the officer that is the target. So um, essentially uh, finding a, having a sustained finding and finding that there's a policy problem would be based solely on the representations of what might be in video and what might be the complainant's point of view uh, without the officer's input for that particular event. 
Um, while yes, there are policy ramifications to be considered, um, and that is certainly the board's job and purview, um, the agency is tasked with investigating complaints against officers. And if we don't have jurisdiction over an officer, we can't perform a full and fair investigation. Um, so I'm not sure how you develop policy based upon an incomplete investigation. Member Galloway. I'm, I want, I want to make an assumption here and I would like you to correct me if I'm wrong and please understand that it's no way intended to be confrontational. But are we starting with, are we starting that justification, that justification from a place of an officer, a former officer will 100% of the time be unwilling to assist in an investigation? Um, Chair Dr. Cass, Member Galloway, uh, yes, and that's based on um, five and a half years of experience of contacting officers that are no longer with the department, even in, even as a witness, not a target, who will not cooperate with our investigations. I understand that. We do have, if it was an egregious enough policy, uh, violation or potential policy violation, and we now have subpoena power. Is that a tool that could be utilized if it was necessary? Uh, Chair Dr. Cass, Member Galloway, yes, there, there is subpoena power and it is, um, it is a possibility for use. Um, I'm, uh, yes, just, Most yes. I mean, and, it's, I, I, I'm of, of, of the 330 some cases that the, the agency opened last year, um, I don't know how many, a handful were administratively closed because the officer is no longer uh, a part of the department. So I think that there's fertile ground there for the board to evaluate policy if in fact the board chose to uh, chose to evaluate policy based upon the investigations that the agency has completed. And I think that you're right. I absolutely think that you're right. I just am uncomfortable with dismissing any other policy violations or policy, not even violations, just um, opportunities, simply because an officer is no longer with the department. Like if that's the very first and the only criteria, it just seems like we're doing ourselves and, it, and our community a disservice and possibly even APD for the sake of expeditiously dispensing with a handful of cases. Chair, Chair Cass, uh, Member Galloway, if in fact you believe that there's a case that we've administratively closed, where you think that there's some fertile policy that needs to be evaluated, then the board could, could vote to do that. Um, I don't believe that any of that has been presented to the board at this point. Yeah, I, and I would agree with that because we only have the complaint and the findings letter stating that it's administratively closed because the officer is no longer with APD. So we don't even have the opportunity for anything else. Um, well, Chair Dr. Cass, Member Galloway, um, in the case that probably is the most recent of controversy, 128-20, uh, uh, there was an extensive extensive allegations regarding uh, uh, the officer and uh, um, officious behavior detailed within uh, the complaint. So if in fact that was something that you believe needed to be pursued from a policy standpoint, then um, when the investigator, after we attempt to contact this officer, um, whether or not we're successful in gaining that officer's cooperation, it will be brought back to you. And then you, the board can decide whether or not there's some policy that needs to be explored. And that's why this is on the agenda.
any other any other comment by the by the board. So what um, again? What was the was this uh, just strictly an item for discussion, or, or how are we going to uh, close this or move on? Um, if the board is is desiring, if this is not just me and member Olivas <laughs> and apparently member Nixon um, interested in pursuing a policy amendment, then then I would be happy to work probably with member Olivas because he has a tendency to say things more clearly than I can um, to draft a policy around this item. But if the board does not wish to pursue it, then it's going to shut me up from here to eternity. Um, any other comments? Yes, member Armio Pruitt. So I have, a, I have a question. Are you, is there an existing policy that you're looking to change or there's a operating, you know, just the way things are being done and we want to create a policy that would put some parameters around that? It's the latter. The latter. There's a lack of policy in place. Thank you. I'm sorry, any other comment? I mean, I, it, it seems to me that, you know, I'll comment, um, that we always have the ability to examine, you know, a, a variety of sources for when we want to make policy recommendations or changes. And there's plenty of, you know, I, I agree with the director Harness, there's plenty of fertile ground in, in other cases, but not only in other cases, but in just, you know, just in uh, observations that we make that, uh, that deal with policy. And there's, you know, policies are constantly being reviewed at, at OPA and uh, PPRB. Uh, there can be, you know, we can weigh in on those if we see a problem. And, it, and it it's typical that, you know, the kind of policy changes that we're talking about here, especially in, off, you know, officer, well, they're all officer cases primarily, but is our, um, our behavioral. I mean, that's one of the places that, you know, in, and that's, what is that, SOP 1-1 where there's you know one of the most common sources of policy violations is that policy. So, I mean, it, it would be kind of remarkable that we would find a, an administratively closed case. I think that had a, a, an officer who left who you know where there was some unusual policy consideration that we would only discover by looking at that case. I mean, it seems like there's there's going to be plenty of examples elsewhere that are going to cover that situation. It's not like we're letting anything fall through the cracks. That so I'll I'll stop with that. Yes, member Armia Pruitt. So I'm I'm not really 100% on on what I think about all this, but I'm wondering like, in terms of approaching this in a way that tries to like alleviate the time demand that we're talking about for investigators and the agency staff. Um, if we have cases where we think, well, if this would have been pursued and we would have known more, even if no disciplinary action can be taken, if the, if the result doesn't have to do with anything to do with like making a, some kind of statement about a disciplinary infraction or a, a policy infraction by someone who's no longer with the agency, with APD, um, then could there be some other process where, you know, if, if a, some minimum parameters of a case are provided, even though it's administratively closed, and and then the board, if they if there was something very, you know, concerning or interesting about a case, could ask for a follow up, um, either a follow up to to provide more information to investigate a little more to see or some kind of policy analysis about that issue. I'm not sure what following up on the particular case, unless there was something in there that really like had your um, antennae up already about like what what kind of a, a policy problem could be, could there be here, right? I guess, I guess I'm trying to figure out what, in terms of balancing the time demand and the extra ask of following this through to going to, you know, subpoena um, former officers who were not going to want to 
to engage anyway, balancing that with what can be gained from more information on those cases. And the other thing, and probably Tina might be able to help out with this um, that just occurred to me, is there are only very specific things per our policies and procedures, which I think track the costs on the ordinance as to why a case can be administratively closed. And none of the things that are listed, if I remember correctly, and if I'm reading this correctly, include the officer is no longer employed with APD. Yes, uh, yes, Ms. Gooch. Member Galloway, uh, you're correct. The CASA defines administratively closed um, as where the policy violations are minor, the allegations are duplicative, or investigation cannot be conducted because of the lack of information in the complaint. However, it's my understanding, and Director Harness can correct me if I'm wrong, IMR evaluations from the monitor team have implicitly or expressly, I'm not sure, expanded the definition for the agency's actions on administrative closure. Um, I believe that's correct, Director Harness, but um, I, I'd be happy to be corrected if I'm wrong. Chair, Dr. Cass, Member Galloway, that's correct. The issue has been discussed in IMR. The alternative is that in, in fact, then we just simply not open a case and have a case number, but if we have a case number, then we have to have some disposition. So that disposition is most appropriately administratively closed uh, due to a lack of jurisdiction, which it has been an accepted finding for um, 15 years um, and is part of uh, part of the part of data collection and 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 beyond that, I mean. Um, if we don't open a case, then there's really uh, no opportunity to let the complainant know that um, there's other redress, most, uh, most, poss most possibly if it involves Rio Rancho or if it, uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting confused here, uh, it, that uh, we just simply lack jurisdiction just like we can't investigate Rio Rancho or Bernalillo County Sheriffs, uh, that person, if they're no longer with the department, uh, whether sworn or non, is a citizen and we just don't investigate citizens. Any other, any other comments? Yes. Chair sure, Member. Yes. Um, so, First on the particulars of this argument, which, you know, I, I see the point here, there's not a lot of cases at the same time, not a lot of cases means not a lot of burden to investigate. Um, and I think we've, we've kind of been presented with a circular argument here. Um, you know, the board can overrule the decision to administratively close, but based on what? If there's not an investigation or investigative file or lapel camera or interviews with the officer or interviews with the complainant, how can the board possibly justify overruling uh, something if there is no background on it? Within that same vein, how can we ever know if there is a policy issue if there's no investigation? So there's, there's sort of this circular logic here. Um, but I think that, that sort of moving to higher levels of, of, of uh, issue here, uh, I, I take some issue with, with uh, the preposition that uh, because this is accepted, uh, accepted practice, it's been accepted practice for 15 years that uh, if an officer leaves employment, a complaint can be administratively closed. That means it's right. Uh, I think we can all think of a lot of practices that have occurred, you know, in, in many, many places that, you know, one could argue, well, that's been the way that we've done this for a long time. So it's right. There's nothing wrong with this. Um, that doesn't buy me. That doesn't buy anything on this argument for me. Um, just because it's the way we've been doing things doesn't mean that it's the right way to do them. Um, and the main thing I think of here, and I actually saw it in the internal affairs report that was presented to us tonight. Um, in one instance, I believe it said uh, officer termination. And then, you know, in, in footnotes said retired. So, you know, in other words, the officer retired when it was time to be terminated by the department for his conduct, his or her conduct, I don't know. Um, 
that also begs a similar question. If there was perhaps a very egregious complaint, maybe doesn't rise to the level of criminal activity and, and an internal affairs issue, um, maybe they would rather just quit, move to a different job, retire, um, whatever. They're no longer employed with the department. So, you know, that kind of becomes an easy out if you, if you just say, well, you know, they can quit and avoid any kind of investigation or, or discipline or, and obviously they can't be disciplined at that point, but uh, it still allows us to look at the policy aspect of it, which really has nothing to do with the individuals. So my last point here is I think that what this shows me is that I'm not as interested in this issue as I am in the, the higher level issue here of how we reform our complaint process to focus more on these weighty issues of looking more at policy and less at individual complaints and individual complainants and individual specifics and wordings of letters and that kinds of things that, that we get hung up on for, for hours in some cases where what we really ought to be looking at is, is the big picture stuff. And I think that some of that starts with trying to help relieve some of that burden from our agency, getting rid of some of these complaints that maybe could be handled at the area command level or if they're, they're frivolous complaints, not accepting them to begin with. Um, and then moving on from there to see where perhaps some of these that are that we may disagree on their current disposition, maybe with that, there's there's room to add those back into the mix and, and do a little more work on those. So I think it's really part of a more um, a larger process to figure out our, our complaints, our complaint situation. And Romeo Pruitt. I agree with that, that last statement, Eric. I think that's a, a, a good way to refocus, I think. Um, and, and I was going to ask the, a similar question about how, how is it handled in like IAFD when you have an officer who is, you know, there's a case about some type of, you know, assessment of use of force, and then they decide to, mm -hmm. to quit. Like, is there any, do those, do those investigations just stop? Does, is it like, okay, well, they're gone. We don't, we're not going to pursue them or are they pursued in order to flesh out something that has more implication for the department at large? Uh, Chair Dr. Cass, member Amiel Pruitt, um, the instances uh, from internal affairs, there would have been the investigation initiated while the member was still a part of the department. Therefore, jurisdiction is available. So I think that the basic premise here as a quasi-judicial board is that there's certain fundamentals within the law that you have to have jurisdiction. So um, I cannot go file a lawsuit in California for an event that happened in New Mexico. You have to have jurisdiction. You have to have the ability to investigate and enforce what you're investigating uh, for that investigation to move forward. So it's simply a fundamental issue of jurisdiction and there's nothing that a policy that you develop is going to change um, the, the issue of jurisdiction uh, for us to investigate a case. We, um, I mean, it's just certain, it's just certain fundamentals within an investigation that have to be there. And one of them is jurisdiction. Member Amir Pruitt. So if the goal is discipline of the officer, I, I can see that point very clearly, Director Harness. I'm, one thing that I keep thinking is, is that always the goal, right? Um, is discipline of the of the specific officer always the goal? And maybe there here's where there's a divergence between the agency and the board, um, and and that the the citizen who makes the complaint is here in our jurisdiction, and the engagement that they had was by someone representing an organization that is present and part of our community as APD. And then they're having this, in terms of how we come back around to the complainant and say, 
well, they're no longer with us. And so we, we really can't look at your complaint, which is what the response would be. And so I wonder if there is a, you know, some value to, to the community member of having their situation validated in some way if there is, you know, the, like this could have been a, a violation of these of these policies, but we cannot know that because this person is no longer with us or or whatever. But I, I, I keep thinking about what could that be, what could be different about this process for those complainants who may have very legitimate um, complaints, uh, but yet they have no closure on that because that person walked away from from the job and or or moved on or whatever. However, we want to word that. Um, but for the complainants, they're still stuck in, in sort of a strange little limbo in terms of where they, they came to the, the agency for some kind of resolution of this issue. So I think that's something to think about too. And I don't know, you know, I still don't know how I feel about this whole issue, but I, it, it's certainly something that makes me have questions. <laughs> so I think it's worth having discussion around. The other uh, thing real quickly... Here. That something that Eric said a second ago about, you know, taking away frivolous complaints, um, trying to minimize like lower level complaints, but also maybe I, I think you used the word frivolous and I'm not sure. And one, one, one issue that I have in these conversations about complaints sometimes is um, Sometimes people come off in ways that um, their complaints or their situations or their narratives don't make a lot of sense. But often people who are very vulnerable to being abused by authority are folks who cannot maintain a, a cogent narrative. Um, and so I would caution us all to, to consider that while a rambling complaint can be hard to get, you know, to, to parse through, those folks are at particular risk for abuse in the community. Um, so that, I just wanted to state that. I was going to bring it up another business later, but um, now seemed appropriate. Uh, well, Chair Dr. Cass, Member Mio Pruitt, let's not conflate issues um, for those that are vulnerable within society and uh, may submit a complaint that um, meets the criteria as you have outlined it let's circle back to what the goal of the investigation is. The goal of our agency is to conduct a full and fair investigation and to develop enough evidence on which we can base a conclusion. That's our job. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what the agency is tasked with in the ordinance and in the CASA. So if we have a missing component, a large component in this case, the APD personnel that are no longer available for interview, a compelled interview, which I, I add, which that tells you how important it is as a part of their employment that they're compelled to cooperate with us. So if we are to conduct investigations without that compelled interview uh, to find facts, um, that is not a full and fair investigation. Our goal is not simply to investigate in order to discipline. Our goal for an investigation is to develop enough information on which we can base a conclusion. Would you prefer that you be investigated um, without participating in that investigation as a part of your employment? And it's just not, I, I mean, I, I just can't stress enough how the fundamental fairness of the investigation can't exist when you don't have jurisdiction over a party. Um, Member Mitchell has his hand up, uh, so Member Mitchell. Yeah, I don't wanna prolong this discussion, but a couple of observations. One, I, I do think we have jurisdiction because we had it when the allegation was brought forth. Uh, secondly, maybe the terminology of administratively closed should be not sustained. So maybe what happens is it gets assigned, the investigator goes as far as they can, they try to contact the person who has left to get their side of the story. They indicate they won't participate. It comes back through to us saying that we can't sustain this uh, complaint 
um, because we don't have a full disclosure on the part of the, one of the parties. I know that's nomenclature, uh, but maybe that kind of can kind of move us off this being just focused on administratively closed as, as the issue and that it, it's kind of a compromise to me. I mean, I, what are we talking about? Five cases a year? I mean, I, I don't know what we're talking about, but I don't think we're talking about very many. And so I would think that, you know, the, that we could, we could reach a compromise as, as I've described. Thank you. Member Amir Pruitt. Um, so just real quickly, I don't know that every, well, I do know that not every case has the voice of the officer represented in an interview, nor the complainant. There was a case tonight that um, Member Nixon brought up, right, that the complainant, the complainant wasn't contacted because there was lapel video footage that seemed sufficient for the investigator to assess what happened, right? And I think that um, you know, there are a number of these where we don't see any interviews of police officers involved. And so I'm just wondering, like, you know, we're talking about a small population, and then we're talking about, you know, some subset of that that would, in the investigator's eyes, they would deem it necessary for an interview to happen. And, and your um, analogy to being, um, you know, having as a uh, having an investigation done without my ability to be involved in it, um, how would I feel about that? Well, I mean, I would say, hey, if I want to be involved, here I am and ask me questions, right? You're not saying they can't be involved. You're saying that they may not choose to be involved, which is a different thing than the scenario you presented. So um, yeah, and I, th I think to, to the nomenclature issue, I think we only have so many things we can call things. Um, and if there's some wiggle room in there that that makes sense to everybody, then I wouldn't be opposed to that. But I think the issue is finding the information, you know, out. But Member Galloway, I'd I would ask that we uh, uh, you, you know, give us some indication of how you'd like to resolve this issue because I think we've discussed it to the point where. There's, it's at the point of diminishing returns, and I'd like to. That's exactly what I'm going to do, Dr. Kath, with your approval. Mm -hmm. I am going to put a pin in this now that we've got the creative juices flowing and we've spent this much time, um, because I do think that this is a worthwhile dialogue to have. But I do think that there is a proposal that's coming up that may also. Um, not negate the need for this conversation, but maybe change the dynamics around it. And so I, I think that if it's all right for whoever our upcoming chair is going to be, if we could put this item on the agenda and I'll remind us uh, for May and give us the opportunity to see what happens with another agenda item um, over the course of the next month and opportunity for response from attorneys, if that's the direction the board chooses to go, then we can pick this up with that information in hand as well. And it'll also give me the opportunity to review IMRs and find the language where the monitor said we close administratively close cases for lack of officer employment. I think so, a motion to table this until the May meeting would uh, solve the problem. Yeah, then I make that motion to table till the May meeting. Do we have a second? Second. Uh, Seeing no further discussion, uh, we have a motion to table, I, I think, and we'll call that um, uh, in favor of tabling this until the May meeting. Uh, Member Amio Pruitt. Yes. Member Galloway. Yes. Member Mitchell. Yes. Member Nixon. Yes. Member Olivas. Yes. Uh, the chair votes yes. So this motion's tabled till the May meeting. All right, moving on. Um, Let's see, I believe we're at uh, diversity and inclusion training. Um, this is your item, Member Galloway. Maybe I ought to let Member Olivas lead this one and just step back from speaking for a few minutes. I'm, I'm happy to. 
Um, I think we've we've uh, heard about this issue in uh, in our meeting last week. We we briefly raised the issue of um, expanding our access to training in this particular issue with regards to uh, diversity and implicit biases. And uh, in fact, you know, we even we even heard that come up in in my own uh, recent statement where you know uh, the verbiage was used with you know not what I intended to be. Uh, harmful consequences, but of course, it's uh, there's there's a variety of of um, implicit biases and and um, personal unknowns that I think we all deal with. And uh, the point here being, we function as a board uh, with very little training on diversity and inclusion biases, implicit and explicit. Yet we are asked frequently to um, judge or review cases that allege these very things, biases and uh, all, all sorts of issues relating to, to these matters. So I think that it's important that we have access to top quality training in, in these matters. Uh, Director Harness did uh, reach out to the city and provided us with, uh, with some training that's available. Um, however, I believe that the member Galloway and I have also uh, pursued a potential alternative to that training, or, or uh, I don't even want to call it an alternative, and maybe in addition to, if members want to pursue both and, and the board chose to, to do so, I think it certainly couldn't have, it couldn't hurt to have more rather than less. Um, but I think that I'll, I'll let this proposal speak for itself uh, with a presenter that, that's here to, to discuss this, but I think that uh, it's very important for us to consider this with an open mind and um, I, I would ask the board to consider this proposal and uh, what, what Ariana has to say, and hopefully we can discuss more on, on the other side. So I don't know if Ariana's here, but uh, if she is, I, I hand the floor over to her. Hi, thank you, um, honorable chair, board members, appreciate you being here. Um, I put together a proposal for you all on a diversity training. This would be a custom diversity training for you all, really designed to support your mission of advancing the constitutional and policing and accountability for the Albuquerque Police Department and the Albuquerque community. And so the my proposed training would be a three-part series where in the first part of the training, you would have a common language and understanding around some different key terms in diversity, inclusion, and equity, and just create a foundation for you all to communicate similarly, understand where unconscious biases come from and how they can manifest. And then in the second training, you would apply those skills and learn how to use those skills for the very work that you do, um, specifically around complaints. And then in the final training, you can use all of that knowledge and the practice using those skills to create a action plan, if you will, that's tailor-made for your board to move forward addressing diversity and equity issues that come up for the board on a regular basis. So that's my proposal to you all in terms of a custom-made diversity planning or diversity training. Um, I'd also add that I do other diversity development trainings and inclusion trainings um, through the University of New Mexico. And those are very much tailored around leadership and workplace um, skills and management. And one of the things that I was thinking as I was putting this together for you all is a lot of those same things that I teach that I think are very valuable and meaningful to people in their workplaces wouldn't apply to you all because they're much more about the relationships and interactions that happen in a workplace and how to manage and facilitate those where you all are at a systems level looking at individual complaints as well as system practices that affect the Albuquerque community. So I will stand for questions if any of you have questions for me. My question is, uh, what kind of time frame and commitment are you looking for? Yeah, so each training would be about two hours. And um, I would propose to do that over uh, a three-month period. So one training per month. 
That way you have time to really reflect on the skills and information that you're gaining and move forward with those um, as a board. I know that's a long time commitment, but diversity and inclusion issues are also a very time consuming skill, also can be very emotionally charged. Um, and so it's important to take that extra time to really in, ingrain them in your understanding and be able to communicate them across board members as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any other, any other questions, comments? Um, I, did, I would like to hear from the, the director regarding the, the probability that this is an acceptable uh, way to go uh, given the, the procurement rules of the city. So if, if we could hear what that, you know, what you know about that. Uh, Chair Dr. Cass, I think uh, we, we did receive some, knowing that this issue was coming, um, we did receive some information from procurement um, from city legal. And um, I think that uh, there would have to be a, an RFP process um, given the, given that um, there are a set of approved vendors through the city and that you now have access to the training from the city's office of equity and inclusion. Um, there would have to be, uh, the RFP and the proposal for this specially designed, uh, training, um, to move forward. Did I get that right, Katrina? Is it our assumption that Adriana is not on that vendor list or do we know that she isn't? Uh, Chair Dr. Cast Member Mitchell, that's correct. Uh, she is not on the vendor list for the city of Albuquerque at this point. Ariana, I'm sorry, Dr. Cass. Yes, uh, go ahead. Ariana, do you work because, because you came to us through Phil Crump who has done work with us and is on our approved vendor list. Is it um, possible that you would work as a consultant with him? I can definitely discuss that possibility with him. And that might help to ease that along if the board chooses to move in this direction, of course. Yes, member Levis. And uh, you know, I, I want to I want to thank Ariana for being here and, and thank the board for for considering this proposal. Um, and I want to I want to offer that that uh, well, I believe this is a really good proposal, and and I, I generally support the the aim of it and and the need of it here. Um, I don't want this to be construed in any way by the public or by other board members as us trying to. Uh, bypass city purchasing requirements or purchasing rules or, or somehow, you know, rig the system here. M my, my desire, and I think, I think I speak for member Galloway as, as well, but I, I don't want to put words in her mouth, is to, to get us a high quality training that really achieves the purpose of uh, the purpose of our board and, uh, and, and of high quality community, uh, I'm sorry, high quality civilian oversight of policing here in Albuquerque. So, that's the goal here. And I think if it, if it takes a little bit longer to get it, uh, I'm okay with that. You know, if, if we have to go through this, this RFP process and we have to get, you know, multiple vendors, I, I don't, I don't really know how that works. I'm not an expert on that. And maybe that's another area we need some training in the, in the future. But um, I, I think my goal was to start this process, start this dialogue. And, and uh, I, I think that this proposal is a great proposal um, but I don't want it to be construed as, as any kind of, of uh, trying to, to flout the rules or anything like that. But I think that the time commitment, I also just want to comment on this, is um, pretty minimal considering, um, you know, our, our overall responsibilities and our lack of this training in the past. I know that there is other training available. I suspect that time commitment is, is probably somewhat similar. Um, and, and if it's 
vastly different in the lower direction, I would question the usefulness of it. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not answering that, but I'm just saying that, you know, this is something that's going to require the board to, to put some time and some thought and some effort into. And we did a similar thing with our facilitated uh, meetings with uh, Mr. Crump and, and um, th that, you know, facilitated conversation the board had. So, you know, I think that in, in some ways this is the, you know, an, another phase of that in a different direction. And then lastly, I wanted to also comment on, on the budget of this. I, you know, I don't know where, where this number lands in the final, you know, say of this, but I do want to just throw out there, you know, the board did not attend NACOL um, in, in the last um, year, at least not in the, in the uh, cost intensive way that it normally does with the uh, air travel and hotel and, you know, the, the many expenses of, that are incurred in that process. And um, I, I think that, that this certainly is a, a justifiable expense in, in that vein, looking at it from that perspective that the board really didn't pursue the, the cost of training opportunities in the last year that it, that it has in the past. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, member Nixon, you had your hand up. Yeah. Um, Ariane, I think that you, you kind of hit the nail on the head when you were speaking to a system versus an employee or employment situation. So as far as I can determine based on your presentation as well, um, you viably, there's definitely an established need. And I think that um, um, Eric would, would agree with that uh, for bringing this in. So what I would do, uh, what I would encourage you to do is you know, go through that process to be put on the list. Um, I think it's a very, I don't think it's a, a heavy lift to do that, but that way that's just one less hurdle uh, you know, standing in the way of, of doing, doing this. And this could be a very beneficial uh, training for us. So, you know, I think that it, I would encourage you to, to, to go through that process. I, I don't think it's going to be heavy lift, but yeah, I, I, I think this would be appropriate. Um, and, and not just with this board, but um, I could see this expanding to different areas of the city government that don't necessarily uh, fit the traditional um, and a venue for, for doing such a training, but it can be adapted to a venue such as ours. So I do encourage you to pursue that. Thank you. Member Mitchell. Yeah, a couple of questions. Well, first a statement. I, I really like the idea of a, of a specialized focus training rather than the shotgun approach. And, uh, but the questions I have for Adriana, are you on a vendor's list for UNM? I am an improved vendor through the University of New Mexico. Yeah, so that may not be a that may not be as complicated as it might be. Are you also on a GSA list? Um, I'm not sure. That's federal government. I'm not sure. I do uh, government work elsewhere. I do program evaluation through the city of Santa Fe as well. Um, yeah. So. So there'd be a Duns number associated with that. Duns D U N S number. Mm hmm. So you may already be on a couple of lists. So getting on the city one may not be all that complicated. So I would, I would endorse going forward, even if it requires an RFP. Our, um, <clears throat> so do we have a, do we, does someone want to move to uh, uh, take an action. We've uh, had a lot of discussion, so uh, I think it's a motion that would be in order. Remember I'd like to make a motion to uh, request, um, I suppose it's agency staff to pursue uh, an RFP um, to, to fit the needs of this uh, specialized training for diversity and, and uh, equity at the board level. Second. Uh, <clears throat> any further discussion? Uh, seeing none. Um, and I would call for a vote to uh, move forward with uh, trying to place this as an R, uh, <clears throat> this contract as an RFP. So is that, is that your motion? Does that capture your motion? I, I believe so, although I would defer to, to Director Harness and, and uh, maybe K Katrina Sagala if, if there's any kind of, you know, anything we need to know since we're not, you know, the, the RFP experts. Uh, Chair Dr. Cass, Member Olivas, um, what is it specifically that uh, 
this board believes it needs a specialized training for equity and inclusion right, over and above what is um, available through the city's office of, and of equity and inclusion. So I think that the, you know several members kind of probably stated that nuance better than me and certainly someone else interrupt me if you want, but um, I, I think that what we're looking for here, uh, Ariana said this too, is um, you know really a systems level equity and diversity and inclusion uh, training that looks specifically at our system, but also at that micro level where we look at complaints and, and, and um, th that sort of thing. So I think it has to be something that's able to sp span the spectrum of, of needs and um, be specific to our particular system of um, policing, which, which is a little bit different than um, a workplace environment, although there's some parallels and I'm sure some of those, those are useful. Um, then, then I would ask that you draft that verbiage so that so that we're clear what we're looking for. Well, that's what an RFP would do. But I think we're a little premature in even asking for an RFP. I think the first thing that needs to happen is Adriana needs to establish if she can even get on the vendors list. If she can get on the vendors list, then we're not required to do an RFP. <clears throat> so I think the way to proceed is to have Adriana explore the possibility of getting on the vendors list. And, and if that can happen relatively soon, <clears throat> then it gets away from this whole issue of needing an RFP. Now the city may have some kind of process uh, through their procurement offices to specialize training, um, which I'm assuming would, it, would involve some consultation with the office that you're describing. Uh, Director Harness. So um, that's just my thoughts. Well, Chair, Dr. Cass, Member Mitchell, is the priority the use of uh, Ariana or is the priority the training? The priority is to get training that's relevant to our function and not just a generalized discussion around these issues. Chair, Dr. Cass, Member Mitchell, yes, then the other avenues are simply to look at the vendors that are available through the city to see if in fact they could customize the training as you wish uh, to provide that training, um, which is an option uh, through the Office of Equity and Inclusion because of the, the providers that they already have. So if you draft a, the verbiage for what you believe the training needs to entail that can go to the Office of Equity and Inclusion and see if in fact they have someone that can provide that for you. And, and these things can be happening simultaneously. Adriana can be trying to get on the vendors list, which may have possibilities for her down the road anyway, whether this training happens for us or not, right? Chair Dr. Cass, Member Mitchell, certainly, um, you know, um, I think the most important part is that we need to have the particular articulation as to what specifically this board believes they need in training for equity and inclusion from a systemic standpoint as a board. Agreed. Member Amiya Pruitt. I have a couple of questions. The first one is for Ariana, and thank you for being here to present this proposal. Um, is your uh, is the cost? Let's say none of this other stuff is a is an issue, but the cost that you have attached to your proposal is that per person? I'm mean, not per person. I know that that's the total, but does the number of people matter that are engaged in it? I'm just wondering because if we can extend an offer, if we do move forward with this to the CPOA staff. Um, to also feel free to join us in this, um, if that would be a possibility if the board is amenable to that. Thank you for the question. And absolutely, um, and we'd be happy to extend the training to additional members of the staff as well. I think that would be beneficial to the board as well to be able to communicate across staff and board. 
thank you so much for your for your answer. And and the other thing I wanted to say is, um, do we? I, I understand procurement is a sticky wicket, right? And and you know all that stuff. So so Ed and and maybe Tina here or Katrina. Um, I understand, you know, if, if she's not on a vendor's list and she doesn't get on a vendor's list, but if that's who, let's say that's who, for whatever reason, we really want to go with, um, and we put out an RFP and not, nobody, no, no other vendors um, knock our socks off in the same way, and um, there are no other, you know, giant variables to consider, then then what's to stop us from doing that? I know you're saying the city offers this, but I, I will say that sometimes when you get, you know, uh, in my opinion, this type of training can be done really well with great benefits and it can be done really, really poorly, um, just like any kind of group training. And I, um, so if we, if we, I'm not saying that the city's folks are bad. I don't know who the city's folks are, right? I, I don't know who's on that list. So I'm not making it, casting any aspersions, but I, what are our constraints if the things I just said are true? So if we, cause I feel like right now you're telling us like we have to justify why we would want something other than the city. Is the city gonna say, I'm asking if there are actual rules around that, like the city's gonna say, Nope, you can't do that because we offer a similar service and there's no way around that. So um, I, I, I think one of the things in play here is that uh, under normal circumstances, if we wanted a training in a particular area, the first thing we would do is we would write a request for, you know, to be sent out. And it essentially would be a request for proposal that would say, we want this kind of training and uh, how can you provide it? And if we were to do that in a, you know, in a normal way, we would send that out, that request out to various potential vendors to re respond to it. So it seems to me that we've we've kind of gotten the cart before the horse here by getting the response to our request for proposal, which we never really submitted to begin with. And so I think what uh, what we're asking for here is to create a a request for what is the kind of training that we want and send that out then to uh, the appropriate places. I don't believe that, because in addition, I don't believe we've really made the comparison between what's available with the city and what uh, Ms. Strott is, uh, has proposed. And, and so I'm, yeah, that's just my, my comment. So uh, Member Galloway, you have your hand up. I do. Um, I, I think, though, that we do, I think Member Armijo Pruitt was actually looking for an answer instead of just hypothesizing and questioning out right. to the ethers. Um, but I, since you brought it up, when we secured the services of Mr. Crump, did we go to RFP for that? Because my understanding was we specifically went with him, so we didn't have to go with an RFP because I had outside people um, that I was asking about as well then, and we kind of yeah. bypassed that completely. Well, the answer to that is he was available without a charge to us. He was under city contract. But it, but we didn't do an RFP no. to even get to that point, right? Right. That's, that's okay. correct. All yeah. right. And then, sorry, Tara, to kind of no get in the way of your question. So I just to, just to clarify, like I understand that piece about the RFP. What I'm asking, though, specifically is, um, Will the city, as Director Harness seems to be saying, tell us that we can't go and put an RFP out if the city provides, if they have contractors available under the category of diversity and inclusion training? Are they going to say, no, you have to justify why you don't want to go with the folks on their list? And that justification would be the customization that we're talking about. And it can't be, well, um, we know people who've used this trainer and they were come highly recommended, whereas your folks don't. Because, you know, that it seems like the reputation or, you know, whatever has been assessed should be part of the conversation, but is that not allowable? And are there specific guidelines around what you can ask for an RFP to be put out for? Chair Dr. Cast member Armijo Pruitt, uh, the first step would be 
for you to put in a request for training and as detailed as possible. And then that training request would go to the Office of Equity and Inclusion for proposals from the vendors that they have. Those vendors would then submit their proposals for the board to review. Um, if you got to the point where that none of those were acceptable, uh, then you could propose the alternative of Ms. Trot uh, as the uh, provider. But the first step is to utilize the, the systems and the people that are already under contract with the city. Uh, that's why you didn't need to go outside for Mr. Crump and Ms. Torres because they were already contracted by the city to provide facilitation and thus they provided it through the city with no cost to the agency. Well, it really, it's really inappropriate for us to even be talking about a vendor. We need to be talking about the required training. And I've done a lot in government procurement and you cannot have any appearance of pre-selection. And so um, I think we have to go back to square one and do as, as Director Harness has indicated and then go forward with that. That does not preclude Adriana from trying to get on the vendors list and she may or may not be the right person and she may or may not get selected. Yeah, unless it's sole source. That's yeah, but it's not. Yeah. It's not sole source, yeah. Member Olivas. Sure, Cass, I'd like to first of all ask, uh, since it's my motion, I would withdraw the motion, but before I do that, uh, I wanna comment briefly on this issue. First of all, I think it's completely unfair that the there are individuals here that are treating us as though we should be procurement experts or we should know these things. We should know that we can't solicit these types of things independently uh, when we were in fact told at, at multiple points, you know, uh, on, on other issues, but, you know, throughout the, the years here that, that you know, we need to take initiative as board members, we, we should, you know, be involved and active and, and come to the board with proposals. So that's what member Galloway and I did. And in fact, we did it through approved city vendors. We went to, to Philip Crump and, and Ms. Torres and, and asked them for their assistance in, in finding someone that could help us get this training um, that wasn't being provided for, um, you know, I've been on the board for, for over two years and it's never been provided to me. And I know from folks that, that have been on the board longer than me that the training that was provided was completely inadequate. So, you know, I don't think this is a, a ridiculous request and I don't think that it's, it's crazy to believe that volunteer board members who, you know, myself, I'm, I'm a private sector person, I don't have any government purchasing experience that we wouldn't understand or, or know how these rules work. So I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm a little bit insulted by that, that, that this is, is somehow surprising to folks that we don't know this. So I apologize for my naivety here, but um, that is the, the sole reason why we pursued this, to try to make the board better, to try to uh, find some training and, and make a proposal that would improve our work together as a board and our work product. Uh, so that's where we're at. Uh, I would ask that, I, I would say that I withdraw the motion and my intention is to take this up uh, at the policy committee and draft a request for training or, or you know, I, I don't think we need to do it in committee. I can bring it back to the board with a request for training um, that specifies specifically what we want and we can take it from there. Personally, I don't think you should withdraw the motion. Um, I think it was totally adequate. I agree with you 100%. But if you do, um, you know, I'd, I'd hope that we'd circle back with this and make this happen because I think it's a, a very good idea from start to finish. So, yeah. Remember me up I, I like the idea of drafting a very specific request though about what we want to see training look like because I do feel like in, in prior situations where we had some um, sort of verbal agreement around what kind of training was being pursued, things um, sort of morphed under our feet. And then when we showed up to trainings, they were not at all what the original plans were. The, the focus had changed and the end goals seem to have changed. 
Um, and so I think just in that sense, I think it would be a really good idea to sit down and have a, a you know, have a written plan about what we would like to have the goals be out of a training like this so that regardless of whatever vendor ends up being um, engaged that we get the training that we're looking for. And thank you for pursuing that, Eric. So, Member Gallo, are you willing to, to pursue that with me? So Member, you know so Member, I will. Good, thank you. So Member Olivas, you've withdrawn your motion? Correct. And uh, so at this point, your proposal is to draft a, uh, essentially an RFP and uh, come back to the board with that at some, at some time in the future uh, with the intent of uh, getting the, you know, specifying the kind of training that uh, you're, you're looking for. I'd make a motion to table this item till the uh, April meeting. Second. 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 Yeah, I'm not just stay away from the term RFP because that has a certain meaning in government. Okay, sorry. Say a, a proposal. A proposal, yes, thank you. Agreed. We'll run it by you, Doug. You sound like you know what you're talking about. <laughs> member member Amio Pruitt, you have a question. Uh, Ariana had her hand up earlier and I don't think it was noticed. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you all for having me. And regardless of how you move forward, I hope you do put together a strong request for training because I think you all do a valuable service for our community and the members of the Albuquerque um, city and it's really important work that you all do and so I really hope that you're able to get a specialized training so that you can help um, the city on a systemic level as well as the individuals that put through complaints so thank you again I appreciate all of your comments and questions. And uh, we appreciate your, your coming in and explaining your proposal to the board. And uh, we our paths may cross in the future soon enough. Thanks. So we have a motion, uh, or do we have a motion? I think we have, a, we have a, you've withdrawn your motion, but you're, you're now making a further motion that you will write, a, you know, that you would like approval from the board to write an RF or write a proposal. So, sorry, Doug. I made a motion to table and member right. gallery. No, I'm sorry. Okay. So there's a motion to table this until the uh, next meeting. Uh, all right. Seeing no further discussion, all in favor of tabling, uh, the director Harness. Yes, uh, Chair Dr. Cass. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a bit perplexed because if there was a training request uh, or something that was needed that has to be facilitated through the city, then the first point of contact should be the agency. Um, we are more than happy to answer those fundamental questions so that there's not confusion moving forward as to how you can accomplish your goals. And that's what we're here for because we are your administrators. Um, so if you have those kinds of questions, it's not hard to pick up the phone and call myself or call Katrina who you know is the one who facilitates all of our procurements uh, to aid you in moving forward. Chair Cass. Member Galloway. I would, um, it's been a very long time that I've had my hand raised and no acknowledgement thereof. And so I would like that noted. Um, but <laughs> as to that last point, Director Harness, in all fairness, I brought this up both in my uh, discussions with you and Dr. Cass from my board member review that this was going to be a thing that Member Olivas and I were scheduled to do, in fact, later that same day. And I brought it up at our outreach committee meeting that this was going to be a request on the agenda. And it was presented to agency staff and Chair Dr. Cass last Friday, last Thursday, when I submitted all of this stuff in writing. So to feign dismay at, um, this coming up tonight and not having the opportunity or, or not taking advantage of the resources available to us is um, concerning. Chair Dr. Cass, Member Galloway, I'm not feigning any 
dismay about this issue coming forward. And as a matter of fact, I said that we would be prepared to discuss the processes for you. And so what we've done tonight is present the processes for you for the city. And we're doing no more than that than presenting those as well, processes. As well as chastising those of us that have gone about this process for not picking up the phone and calling. I don't, Chair, Chair Dr. Casmember Galloway, a suggestion is not a chastation. All right, so is there any other discussion on this issue before we call the vote? So in favor of tabling this until- Chair Cass. Yes. I'm sorry, I just had one question for the director. Is, uh, is the agency not responsible for providing diversity training to the board? Chair sure, Dr. Cass, member Olivas, yes it is. And as a matter of fact, uh, the agency provided you access to the training through the Office of Equity and Inclusion, which no other board has access to at this point. So you have access to the monthly trainings that come from the Office of Equity and Inclusion moving forward starting last month. I would note that I've been on the board since I believe uh, July of 2019. I have never received access to any offerings of diversity training until perhaps the month of February, 2011. So I don't think that's a fair assessment that it was offered to me. It was offered to me very recently when the issue was raised with you that this was lacking. So I appreciate that, that you have made that available and I appreciate that you have informed us on the correct processes for pursuing this, but I would also hope that the effort of individual volunteer board members to pursue what they felt was a, a, a needed uh, goal, I think that should be appreciated too. So thank you for making this training available and, and I hope we can continue this conversation in a more productive way. I would like to call the question. All right, the question's been called. Um, in favor of tabling this uh, action, uh, Member Armia Pruitt. Yes. Member Galloway. Yes, with my thanks to Ariana. Member, Member Mitchell. Yes. Uh, Member Nixon. Yes. Member Olivas. Yes. The chair votes yes. So this motion's tabled um, unanimously, six nothing. So moving on. Um, we uh, have a report from uh, Member Nixon that the uh, um, audit, the cases have been randomized and, and selected. And so I would turn this back over to Member Nixon to go back to our item, um, what is it on the agenda? The um, randomization process, which came as under the report from subcommittee, which would have been item 10 um, C, I believe. So Member Nixon, do you, do you wish to announce the random cases that have been? Yeah. So there, here are the random cases um, and I put them through a randomizer. Uh, what is this, random.org? So you just put in the case numbers and then hit random and it randomized it for me. So uh, the first uh, case that's randomized is 02521. The next case is 170-20. Uh, and the last case is 248-20. Uh, any questions? Thank I, I think I don't. I'm not sure this requires any discussion. I we appreciate your report. Thank you. All right, so we are uh, back on the agenda, <clears throat> and we are at the uh, elect uh, item M, which is the election of a new CPOA board chair and vice chair. Do we have nomination for chair for the uh, CPOA? Member Galloway. I nominate Member Olivas as chair. Um, Member Nixon. I second that. All right. Any Member Mitchell? I would nominate uh, Mr. Cass. He can't um, serve. Can't. Oh, can't. You can't do it too. Okay. And I would second the second. It, are 
Sorry. You're muted. Yeah, I can't. I can't get it right. Okay. Are there other nominations for chair for the board? Seeing no further nominations, I would uh, call for a vote to uh, elect uh, Member Oliva's chair of the board for the next year. Um, Member Armio Pruitt. Yes. Member Galloway. Yes. Member Mitchell. Yes. Member Nixon. Yes. Member Olivas. Yes. And the chair votes yes. So uh, uh, Member Olivas is elected chair of the board. So vice chair, nominations for vice chair of the board. I'd like to nominate uh, Member Galloway. Second. Third. Any other any other nominations for vice chair of the board? All right. So uh, seeing no further nominations in favor of Member Galloway for as vice chair, uh, Member Armia Pruitt. Yes. Member Galloway. Yes. Member Mitchell. Yes. Member Nixon. Yes. Member Olivas. Yes. And the chair votes yes. So Member Galloway is elected vice chair of the board. So item M, we designate uh, the rep board representative for the PPRB. Um, Director Arnold says it's in the hand up. Nominations for representatives. I'm sorry, are you Director Harness? Yes, thank you. Uh, congratulations to the new officers, but I wanted to step back and say thank you for to uh, Chair Dr. Cass and Vice Chair Olivas this year for your service to the agency. Um, thank you very much for uh, what you've done and we look forward to continue to working with you and congratulations to the new officers. Thank you. Um, all right, so item N, designate the board representative for the PPRB. So do we have nominations for that position? Member Galloway. With as time consuming as that is, um, I don't know if Dr. Cass, if you're still interested in serving in that role. Yes. Um, you are? Okay. And the only other thing is I was gonna ask Member Mitchell if he had any interest in serving in that role. <laughs> no, <clears throat> considering some health issues that I've discussed with Dr. Cass and Director of Harness, I think it probably wouldn't be prudent. Then I would um, nominate Chair Dr. Cass uh, for the PPRP representative for this next year. Second. Uh, any other nominations? Seeing none, um, we'll have a roll call vote for uh, PPRB representative, Member Armia Pruitt. Yes. Member Galloway. Yes. Member Mitchell. Yes. Member Nixon. Yes. Member Olivas. Yes. And I vote yes. Chair votes yes. Ex chair votes yes. All right. So the, we've selected the member for the PPRB. Uh, and we are now at item 12, which is meeting with council pen, uh, regarding um, limited personnel matters pursuant to NMSA 1978, section 10-15-1H2 executive director evaluation. So I would have a, I need a motion to move into closed session and then we'll have a roll call vote. So moved. Second. And uh, all in favor of moving into closed session for the, these uh, pending, uh, for the <coughs> for meeting with council, member Armia Pruitt. Yes. Member Galloway. Yes. Member Mitchell. Yes. Member Nixon. Yes. Member Levis. Yes. And chair votes yes. So we're moving to we will move into closed session. So Gov TV, we will be back um, in a bit.
All right, this is the uh, uh, meeting of the uh, Board of the Civilian Police Oversight Agency returning from closed session, uh, where uh, only uh, limited personnel matters were discussed pursuant to NMSA 1978, Section 10-15-1H2 uh, regarding the direct Executive Director evaluation. So I need a motion to come back into open session. Um, so moved. Second, we have a second. I'll second it. All right, roll call to come back in the open session. Member Amino Pruitt. Yes. Did, did you vote? I'm sorry. All right. Yes. Okay. Member Galloway. Yes. Member uh, Mitchell. Yes. Member Nixon. Yes. Member Olivas. Yes. Your votes yes. So we're back in open session. Uh, so we have. Um, we're entertaining uh, a motion from the floor regarding, um, uh, it's yours, uh, let's see, Member Levis, are you, Member Galloway? So I move that we delegate edits and finalization to Member Olivas for delivery of a letter and evaluation matrix for the 2020 evaluation as approved by the board. We have a second? Second. All in favor? Uh, Member Armio Pruitt. Yes. Member Galloway. Yes. Member Mitchell. Yes. Member Nixon. Yes. Member Olivas. Yes. The chair votes yes. So that motion is carried. Uh, Member Mitchell. Yeah, I would move that uh, once the letter is finalized, that uh, the uh, chairperson of the personnel subcommittee, Mr. Olivas, and the previous last year's chairperson of the Civilian Police Oversight Board meet with Director Harness to go over the letter. A second? Second. All right, all in favor, Member Amio Pruitt? Yes. Member Galloway? Yes. Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Olivas? Yes. Chair votes yes, motions carried unanimously. All right, so we are at item 13, other business. Is there any other business? Member Galloway. Yeah, um, I just want to go back. Uh, I had asked for an item to be placed on the agenda that wasn't, and I don't suspect that it needs to be voted on by the board, but since it was a part of the board packet, I do want to make sure that we um, discuss it. So the outreach subcommittee is asking for legal counsel to work with Director Harness to determine the viability of re reducing or removing the case review portion of the board's um, current operating to uh, allow us to focus more on policy work rather than the case review. And so I think, I think that Director Harness can just do this. With, um, with Tina uh, as the executive director, but it was on, it was supposed to be on for the board discussion and I think it was included in our packet. So Tina, is that accurate that, and Ed, that you guys can just do that together without board vote for use of your time, Tina? Uh, Chair, uh cast member Galloway, I believe that it is correct that Director Harness, the current chair or the board can instruct me on how to help the board with whatever legal questions it might have. Okay, thank you. Um, so if, if Director Harness, I'm sure you're prepared to have that conversation with Tina and explore that possibility, so. Uh, Chair Dr. Cass, Member Galloway, yes, I am prepared to have that discussion. Thank you. Any other business? Member Armio Pruitt. Super quickly, the ADA training, the little piece that I went to, uh, the training that had some stuff about that, mentioned that on Zoom, we should be um, 
navigating our conversations as if someone uh, keeping in mind that um, folks who that could be blind folks following our conversations and so we should be identifying when who's speaking and when and like earlier we did a little vote and folks were I don't know if it was a lag on my thing or if people were just in a hurry to get the vote done and they were like saying yes before their name was called and so that kind of um it just reminded me that we had that discussion that I, in that training, they brought that up. And so it's something for us to be mindful about. Member Galloway. Which reminds me, I actually, um, thank you so much, Tara, because I noticed that Director Harness and Kelly Mensa had included with their name, their position with the agency, which I think is super helpful for people who are at home watching. And I wondered if we might consider doing that as a board as well. Um, identifying ourselves as board member or chair or, or whatever the case might be. It might make conversation a little bit easier to follow if you're watching. So I think that that's a really great thing that the agency has included. And then the second thing, um, Eric had mentioned earlier hours ago about our policy work and the, the quantification of it being a little bit nebulous. And I was kind of wondering how the board felt and maybe Eric, just as chair, if you're amenable to this and setting your agendas, when we have presentations by APD that are different from the typical reports that we get, for example, the CACU presentation or the one we're talking about with the canine unit possibly happening, having that be its own agenda item so it can be quantified a little bit easier. Just a thought. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a great idea. It sounds like something that you know makes makes it a little bit easier to to quantify and, and track and and you know justify that this is time spent. Um, I know we heard that came came up last week in our in our board member board review, you know where we we had that conversation. So I think that's something we can work work together on. Any other business? If seeing no other business, uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Uh, Second. Second. Uh, in favor of adjournment, uh, Member Amy Pruitt. Yes. Member Galloway. Yes. Member Mitchell. Yes. Member Nixon. Yes. Member Olivas. Yes. And the chair votes yes. We are adjourned. Our next regularly scheduled meeting is uh, April 8th at uh, 5 p.m. Good night, Thank all. Thank you all. Have a good night.